it's love And it seems I can hardly go But still I see victory Many times I'm walking by faith And can't see what lies before me But still I see victory friends this is until and today i have a very special story for you called breakfast by the sea our memory verse is from ephesians 4 32 and it says be kind to one another look this is peter peter and his friends are in a boat what is peter doing peter and his friends are fishing with a net. Do you see the sun coming up? The night is over. They have been fishing all night. It is time to stop fishing. But Peter has no fish. No fish for Peter. No fish for his friends. Peter, James, and John in a sailboat. Peter, James, and John in a sailboat. Peter, James, and John in a sailboat. Out on the deep blue sea. Fished all night and caught no fishes. Fished all night and caught no fishes. Fished all night and caught no fishes. Out on the deep blue sea. Peter and his friends are very tired and very hungry too. They have been fishing all night and haven't eaten anything for a while. Poor Peter. But listen, someone is calling Peter. Peter! Did you catch any fish? Who's it? Peter asks. I don't know, his friends say. Has Peter caught any fish? No, no fish. So Peter says, No, no fish. Listen. The man calls again. Throw the net on the other side. It is too late for fishing, the fishermen say. See the sun? It is daytime. So the voice calls again. Throw the net on the other side. So 
they throw their net on the other side of the boat. Down, down, down the net goes. Down under the water, down under the boat. And when they try to pull the net, do you see? Fish, lots of fish. Jesus said, throw the net on the other side. Jesus said, throw the net on the other side. Jesus said, throw the net on the other side. Out on the deep blue sea. Now their nets are full of fish. Now their nets are full of fish. Now their nets are full of fish. Out on the deep blue sea. The net was full of fish. Big ones and small ones, all types of fish. Look, that man is Jesus, Peter's friends say. Jesus had helped them fish all of those fishes. So Peter shouts, Jesus! And he jumps out of the boat and hurries to Jesus. Then He goes back to help his friends with the net full of fish. Soon, they were all together again. But Jesus had one more surprise. See the fire on the beach? See the food? Jesus had made breakfast for his friends. He knew his friends were very hungry. So... He surprised them with a delicious breakfast. They all sat down to eat. It was a beautiful morning for a breakfast by the sea. Peter and his friends would never forget about Jesus' kindness. Our Bible says, Be kind to one another. Let's ask God to help us be kind too. Dear God, thank you very much for being so kind to us. Please help us be kind to one another as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Never forget, Jesus was kind to his friends, and you can be kind to your friends too. Hello, boys and girls. This is Aunt Fernita. And I have a wonderful story for you called The You First Way. Today's memory verse is from Mark chapter 9, verse 35. It says, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last. The message for today's story is we serve others when we let them go first. Have you ever raced with someone? Maybe you wanted to be first to the swings, or the first to play with a toy. We all like to be first. A long time ago, Jesus had something special to say about being first. Jesus and his disciple friends walked along the road to Jerusalem. The disciples had seen and heard many exciting things as they traveled with Jesus. Now the disciples were excited because they thought that very soon Jesus would become the king of their land. Many people wanted Jesus to be king. They thought that if Jesus became their king, things would get better. The disciples wanted important jobs when Jesus became king. They talked about who would have the best jobs. They even argued who would be first in Jesus' kingdom. James and John, who were brothers, said to Jesus, When you are king, we want to sit right beside you. One of us could be on your left, and the other one could be on your right. When the other disciples heard James and John talk to Jesus, it made them very angry. Why should you two be next to Jesus? They argued. We deserve to sit next to Jesus just as much as you do. We want to be first. Hmm. Jesus knew his friends did not understand what it meant to be first with him. He called them to come a little closer. You know that some people think that if they are first, they are better and greater than anyone else. But I see it differently. I think the greatest people are the people who think of others first. 
if you want to be first with me in my kingdom, then you will think of others first. That is my way of being first. The disciples listened quietly. They remembered how Jesus always helped others, how he made people feel better. They had seen him heal those who were blind. He healed people who could not walk. The disciples had heard Jesus speak kindly to everyone, and now they were ashamed. Then Jesus smiled a big, warm smile. I didn't come here to have people to do things for me, he said. I came here to do things for them. And that's what I want you to do too. You can be first for Jesus every day. You can look for ways to make someone else happy. You can put others first. You can be a helper. Being first in Jesus' way is fun. Hi everyone, it's Aunt Fernita. Today's story is called Human Gods. Today's message is We Serve God When We Help Others. The memory verse is from Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. It says, Carry each other's burdens, and you will fulfill the law of Christ. Denise and Cameron were new to the country. Everyone looked so different, and many of them spoke a different language. It was a strange experience, but they shared their toys and helped others. Pretty soon they made friends, but they also had some kids who did not like them. Just like Denise and Cameron, Paul and Barnabas traveled to a new place where they didn't know anyone. They traveled to share the good news of Jesus' love. Here's the story of what happened next. Paul and Barnabas stopped to rest by the roadside. They looked at the city before them. Most of the people of Lystra don't know anything at all about the God of heaven, Paul sighed. Not for long, Barnabas smiled. The two apostles prayed, Show us, Lord, how to let the people of Lystra know the good news about Jesus. They walked on and soon entered the city. The two friends began to talk to people. Soon, several of the townspeople had gathered to listen. As he spoke, Paul noticed a man who had never been able to walk. Paul may have silently prayed, He believes you, Jesus. You can make him well. Then Paul said to the man, Stand up on your feet. And the man jumped up and walked. Amazing! Unbelievable! People began to shout, How could this be? Someone in the crowd shouted, The gods! The gods have come down to visit us! Others agreed. They believed that their gods sometimes came to help them in miraculous ways. After seeing the lame man healed, they were sure that Paul and Barnabas were gods too. The people became so excited, they shouted, Let's have a celebration! We can offer sacrifices to these gods and give them gifts! Paul and Barnabas moved among the crowd. No, 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 they said. You don't understand. We're people just like you. We have come to tell you the good news about the real God, the true and living God. He is the one who made the sky, the earth, the sea, and everything that is in them. But the people were determined to worship Paul and Barnabas. About that time, some Jews heard about the excitement. They came to see it for themselves. These men wanted to stop the work of Paul and Barnabas. They saw that the townspeople were upset because Paul and Barnabas had stopped their celebration. So it wasn't hard to make them turn against God's men. Very quickly, the same people who had wanted to worship the apostles now wanted to kill them. In fact, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city thinking he was dead. The Christian believers of Lystra sadly gathered around Paul. He was bruised and bleeding, but he got up. They helped him back to the city where they could care for him. 
but Paul and Barnabas decided to leave that place. We will travel to Derby for a little while, but we will come back soon to help you and to encourage you. Paul and Barnabas were willing to show God's love to others. Their words and kind actions led others to know Jesus. How about you? How can your actions say, Jesus loves you, to someone this week? In a world surrounded by darkness, there is a voice that whispers to every young heart, urging them to find the treasure of truth. Those who follow the path will discover eternal riches beyond their wildest dreams. Join us now for an amazing adventure, a journey for life with Jesus. Good evening, friends. Welcome again. This is night number seven of this 10-part series called Amazing Adventure, A Journey for Life with Jesus. We'd like to welcome all of our viewers across the country and around the world. We'd also like to welcome our local group right here in Richardson, Texas. I'm glad to see all of your smiling faces this evening. Again, if you have not received your lessons yet, please go to the Amazing Facts Kids website. You can order the lessons. They're interactive. I know a number of our children right here at the local site have filled out their lesson guides and they're well on their way to getting their Bible at the end of the series. Well, let's stand together as we sing our theme song, Life is an Adventure. Please remain standing. I'm going to invite our helpers to come forward this evening. Byron will be giving us our scripture reading tonight. Byron, what are you reading for us? 1 Corinthians 10, 30, 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. All right. Thank you very much. And our prayer is coming to us from Emily. Is that correct? Dear Jesus, thank you for this wonderful day that you've given us, and bless this church as we go through tonight. Watch over us, and bless Pastor Doug as he teaches to us. Help us to learn more about you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you very much. Please be seated. I'm going to invite Pastor Doug to come forward. Pastor Doug, it's Bible question time. Good evening, Pastor Ross. I'm always excited about this time, and uh, your questions come in fresh each day, so... Looking forward to it. Okay, well, let's go right to the uh, video and we'll get our first question for tonight. My name is Tendeshe, I'm eight years old, and my question is, how often should we pray? Good question, how often should we pray? Now, there's a scripture that tells us we should pray without ceasing. Well, does that mean that we go around on our knees all day long praying? Well, some people take it that way and they get sore knees. 
what it means is be in an attitude of prayer that God is with you and near you all the time. But you can read in the Bible in Psalm 55, verse 17, King David said, Morning, evening, and at noon will I pray. Not only that, Daniel, in Daniel chapter 6, it tells us that he had a pattern three times a day ever since he was a child, he would take time aside for God to pray. Now, how many of you always pray over your food before you eat? It's always good to thank God for your food and ask him to bless your food. How many of you eat three times a day? Well, so that's a start. You're at least praying over your food three times a day. But you should have private time with God every day. Every morning in our house, I take time to read the Bible. We encourage the bachelor boys to have their own private time. Then we read something together as a family. Before we go to sleep at night, we kneel, we pray together. And you should, during school or lunch or something, take a few moments and pray and talk to God and just ask Him for continued strength that you can be a good witness. But never forget that Jesus said, I am with you always. So talk to Him all through the day. That's the best thing. Pastor Doug, we have a question that somebody wrote in. If there is only one Jesus, how can people on the other side of the world see Him when He comes? Well, that's a good question. You know, we included that because we get it a lot. Do you still have our globe somewhere? You know, I thought we'd take our globe we borrowed last night and uh, use it as an illustration. All right, let's pretend that Pastor Ross is Jesus. And the world turns like this. And as he comes, the world's turning. He sweeps around the world. The Bible says that the, the righteous are caught up to meet him in the air. So he comes from this direction. As the world's turning, he sweeps around, vacuums everybody up. And then the heads back to glory. So it never says in the Bible, every eye will see him at the same time. It says every eye will see him when he comes. And so if the world turns like that, every eye is going to see him. Isn't that right? That's all you got to remember. All right. Well, thank you very much, Pastor Doug. We have another video question, and we'll play that at this time. My name is Nicholas. I'm eight years old. And my question is, why didn't God create everything at once? Why didn't God create everything at once? Well, I think that he wants us to enjoy the, the things that he made. And, you know, the Lord seemed to break up the creation. Keep in mind, does God have angels that watch? They were enjoying the creation. The Bible tells us in the book of, of Job, all the sons of God shouted for joy when they saw the world being created. And so they were enjoying it, and God was spreading out the, the splendor and the magnificence of his creation. Now, while we're on the subject of creation, we don't normally do this, but uh, I'm going to ask Nathan if he'll come up here for a second. And look, Nathan is the other, he's the youngest of the bachelor tribe. And, the, you know, I just came all the way from California. i got to use him once, you don't mind. Look in there and find out if you can find something in that chest. Open it gently, Nathan, that you might use to bake a cake. I want to illustrate something. You know, a lot of people in the world don't believe in creation. Are you aware of that? They believe in another theory about how we got here. What is it called? Evolution. evolution. And uh, evolution is the idea that everything just kind of happened by accident over millions of years. Now, how many of you know what this is? Don't turn it. Huh? What's it called? They call it an egg beater. They don't use these anymore, but they used them for about 100 years until they got the electric ones, and some people still use them. But... Go ahead, put that on the ground and just spin it for a second. I don't think it'll hurt the carpet. Don't spin too fast. Now, I understand there's a shortage of oil, so who knows? We're in Texas, right? Might find something. You notice there are three parts to that. Okay, you can lift it up and show them how it spins now. You got the handle, you got the crank, and you got the mixers. It's a very simple invention, but this doesn't happen by itself. If you dug one of those out of the ground, would you think that it came from nature? It just evolved because lightning hit the ground? Or does somebody have to make that? Just those three moving parts together require intelligence, don't they? There's a design there. There's organization. You notice when these things are spinning, they don't hit each other. Someone had to plan that. That would never happen by accident. What's more complicated, an egg beater or one single cell of life? A single cell of life that God made is a thousand times more complicated. Okay, we thank, you could take that back. Just don't play with it during the program. <laughs> That's, that, to me, is a very simple illustration that helps us understand God had to create. There's so much complexity and, and so much design 
in our bodies, in nature, that there had to be a God. If we don't believe that an egg beater happened by accident, how much more difficult or complicated is, is life? We'll get another All right, we do. Here. We do have a written question here. This is a question uh, probably a lot of folks are wondering. If killing is wrong, why did God help David to kill Goliath? You know, a lot of people have asked that question because one of the Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt not kill. kill. But you know, that is not the best translation from the Hebrew. Jesus quotes that same commandment in the New Testament and he says, Thou shalt not commit murder. Killing, if you pull up a weed, you're killing. If you step on an ant, how many of you have swatted a mosquito before? Killers! Every one of you. Is that what the commandment's talking about? No. Now there's a difference between killing and murder. When a soldier defends his country, is he a murderer? No. No, it's, he's defending his country. If a policeman has to shoot somebody who's threatening someone's life, or if he has to shoot a murderer because they're going to hurt someone else, do you call the policeman a murderer? No. Or he, he's just executing justice. When David went against Goliath, that giant was threatening the whole army. He was threatening the country. They wanted to enslave God's people. During times of war, God even sent his soldiers like Joshua to fight battles to protect the freedom of his people so they could even worship God. And so I know it's a difficult subject and God doesn't want anything to die. God, God creates everything to be alive. In heaven there will be no more death. But the commandment actually says, thou shalt not murder. That's how Jesus quotes it. Well, Pastor Doug, our last question for tonight is a video question. Okay. My, my name is Jesse and I'm, and I'm eight years old and my question is why did God make people different? What? By the way, that's the youngest of the Ross tribe. <laughs> um, why did God make us all different? What would the world look like if God made people like someone in a cookie factory so he just started stamping us all out? And we all looked exactly the same. You've all got different fingerprints, everybody in the world. The iris in your eye, they can check that. And no two people in the world have the exact same iris in their eye. God is so unique, no two stars are the same. He has them all named. You know, the Bible says he can even number the hairs of our head. Now, it's not so hard for me, right? But uh, that's a miracle. He's got names for the stars. He wants... He likes things to be unique, and he loves that you're an individual. And that's why he made us all different. All right. Well, thank you very much, thank Pastor Doug. We're going to invite the amazing adventure singers to come forward. They're going to be giving us a song called The Tree Song.
Thank you. That song was based on the first psalm. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. He will be like a tree planted by the uh, streams of water. I enjoyed that very much. Thank you. Okay, tonight we've got an exciting lesson. Matter of fact, the lesson tonight is a real adventure. And I want to welcome everybody who is studying with us around the country, other parts of the world. And our presentation tonight is dealing with the subject of God's superfood. If you're going to go on this adventure to heaven, those adventures need to have strength. They need to have endurance. And you know, the Bible tells us that there are some secrets, that if you follow these secrets, you're going to have longer, stronger life. I know it's true. God has an outline for superfood in the Bible. And uh, we're going to learn about that tonight. These things are true. You know, a couple of years ago, our family went to Australia. And we stopped by the Australian Zoo there. And while we were there, we took a picture of not the prettiest animal, Harriet the tortoise, but the oldest animal in the world. Matter of fact, Harriet originally was picked up, they're not exactly sure how old she was, picked up by Charles Darwin when she was only about... Uh, 10 inches across like a dinner plate, in 1835. Brought back to England with two other tortoises. As a matter of fact, they named them Tom, Dick, and Harry. And poor Harriet, for 100 years, they were calling her Harry before someone found out that Harry was a Harriet. Brought, didn't do very well in England. Her brother and sister uh, died because of the cold climate, and so someone brought her back to Australia, and she lived in the botanical gardens there for years and years, and outlived many people. And when we went to see her, she was 176 years old. And you know, I took those pictures. We watched her eat. She's a vegetarian. That has something to do with her long life. Now, she just passed away a little more than a year ago, but you're not doing too bad if you live to 176 in this life. You know, the Bible says that there's things you can do in your life by your living patterns that will help you to be stronger and have a longer life, to be more abundant and joyful. Question number one, let's get to our lessons, okay? Does God care? Does the Bible tell us that God cares about the health of our bodies? Answer, 3 John, verses 1, I'm sorry, verse 2, it says, uh, I pray that you might prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. God cares about our physical prosperity just like our soul prosperity. What good is it if, if you go through life and you say, you know, I know Jesus, but I just feel terrible because of my uh, bad living habits. The Lord wants you to feel good in your heart and he wants you to feel good in your body and to be strong. Did Jesus spend time just teaching or did he also heal people? Have you ever been healed by the Lord? God has miraculously healed me before on more than one occasion where I felt bad, I felt sick, I had pain, I prayed, and God did something and took it away. I believe that God can heal. But there's things that you can do to help God strengthen and heal you. Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in the synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of disease and sickness among the people. The Bible tells us that God wants us to have abundant life. You can read about that in John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus said, that man in the picture, 
His name is Banana George. I think he's 93 years old now. That picture was taken, I think he was in his 80s. And he's not just water skiing, he's water skiing barefoot. And you know what else? I don't think he's got dentures or that rope would fly out of his mouth. He's probably hanging on with his own teeth. He says, Jesus said, I have come that, oh, by the way, his favorite food is bananas. That's why he wears yellow all the time. I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. The Lord wants us to have good health and an abundant life. Now, let me tell you what the most important part of your health is. Sitting on top of your shoulders, on top of your neck, you got a big bubble called a head. Your head has got the most sacred organ of all. It's called your brain. When you're an adult, it'll weigh two and a half, three pounds. Do you know that your brain, when you're thinking, uses about 25 watts of electricity? That's enough to power a bulb. Your brain is only about 2% of your body's weight, but it uses about 20, 25% of the body's energy and blood. I know sometimes after teaching or preaching for a couple hours, I'm really tired and all I've done is stand, but a whole lot of fast thinking has to happen. And your brain works, but it's not a muscle. Your brain is what's telling your fingers to move. I can do this with my eyes closed because my brain is telling me. And your brain is telling your eyes to follow me while I move, and it's focusing. Your brain is keeping your heart temperature or your body temperature. It's keeping your heart beating. You're not even thinking about your breathing, but you've been breathing your whole life. Did you know that? Your brain is regulating a million functions in your body all at the same time. And it's your brain that God speaks to. When God wants to speak to you, He doesn't speak to your knee or your elbow. You could lose your feet and your hands, and can God still save you? You can, matter of fact, there's some people lose their arms and their legs, and they still have amazing lives. But if you lose your head, you're in trouble, right? So this is the most sacred holy of holies, your brain. You want to take care of your mind. The devil wants young people's minds to be all cloudy from poor living practices where they can't hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's why this lesson is so important tonight. Because God wants to speak to you and he wants you to be able to hear him and understand his truth. And some kids can't understand because of the way they're living. Number two, what food did God plan for people to eat when he first made Adam and Eve in the creation? What was the original ideal diet that God had for people to eat? You can read this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 29. God said, see, I've given you every herb that yields seed and every tree whose fruit yields seed. They will be food for you. And then after Adam and Eve sinned, then God added vegetables to the diet. He says in Genesis 3, verse 18, you shall eat the herb of the field. So the original diet for man was what you call a vegetarian diet. Nothing had to die. The lions did not chase down and jump on the baby deer and eat them. The wolves did not eat the lambs. Snakes did not bite. Mosquitoes did not suck blood. In the beginning, everything was perfect. Nothing died. And that means, what did the animals eat? Man and animals ate a vegetarian diet. And during that time, man lived a long time. That was the ideal diet for man. Now then after the flood and after sin, all kinds of problems came into the world and people started to kill animals. But he wanted them to return to the ideal diet and God showed how much better off they could feel when he saved them out of Egypt. Matter of fact, God gave the children of Israel superfood. You remember when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt and they went into the wilderness? What kind of food did he give them? Manna from heaven. They called it, it's like angel's food. And it says in Deuteronomy 6, verse 24, and I hope you're writing some of these verses down, especially if you don't have a lesson. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes for our good always, that he might preserve us alive. Now, after 40 years of eating the food that God had given them in the wilderness, and those children must have had fun. We talked about this yesterday, going out and gathering that manna and making it into cookies. You can make manna cookies. You can make manna muffins. You can make manna rolls. You could probably make manna donuts if you wanted. They made all kinds of things probably out of manna. It was like their flour. Forty years of eating that food, how was the health of the children of Israel? Psalm 105, verse 37. 
He brought them out. There was none feeble among their tribes. That means there wasn't one sick person among over, probably over two million people. No hospital, no infirmary, no clinic. Everybody was healthy because they were eating, they were getting sunshine, they were walking every day and getting exercise. You know, in America, with all of our conveniences, there's a lot of sickness and disease, even though we've got a lot of hospitals, because people sit at home, they don't exercise, they use a remote control and cruise control in their car, because you don't want to get your toe too tired pressing on the gas pedal. And you don't even have to dial your phone anymore with your fingers, you just talk and it dials. And so we don't get enough exercise, and we stay inside offices all day long, or you stay inside houses watching television or playing video games, you don't get the sunshine, and there's a lot more sickness. When he brought that nation into the promised land, there wasn't one feeble person. God wants us to be healthy. Let me give you another story in the Bible. Don't forget this, Daniel chapter 1. What did I say? Daniel, Daniel chapter 1. If you forget everything else, just read that whole chapter, and you'll get this story. You can read in Daniel chapter 1 about when Nebuchadnezzar, the great Babylonian king, he conquered the land of Israel. And when he did, he carried away back to Babylon thousands of the people to serve as craftsmen and artisans in his kingdom. And he took some of the young people and he said, I'm going to train them to sit in my court, to be advisors, to be ambassadors. And he found the brightest and, and the uh, most promising of the young people. He brought them to the Babylonian training school and he said, we're going to feed you from the Babylonian cafeteria. And among those young men were four individuals. Their names were Daniel, Hananiah, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. I'm getting there. They have Hebrew names. They have Babylonian names. I was mixing them all up. And those four young men were very thankful that they had the privileges of the palace, but there was a problem. Question number three. What decision did the boys make and what was the result? When they found out that they were going to be required to eat the Babylonian food, which had a lot of things in it that God's Word said was unclean and not good, they made a decision. It says, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat and with the wine which he drank. You know, the Bible says there's some things you can eat and some things you can drink that defile you. For instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, do you not know that you are the temple of God? That the Spirit of God dwells in you? Your body is God's temple. And the warning is very serious. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. God wants to live in your body. And he lives in your mind. And he wants it to be a pure dwelling place. Don't we treat a church with special respect? Because it's a dwelling place. We call it the house of God. Well, your body is supposed to be a dwelling place for God's spirit. He wants you to take care of your body. He made your body. And then when the devil kidnapped the world, Jesus bought your body back again. Remember the story about the sailboat? And so you should take care of your body. Not only to honor God, because you'll feel better. Let's go back to our story of Daniel. Daniel and his friends said to the uh, man in charge of them, Ashvanes, tell you what, give us a 10 days test. He said, test your servants for 10 days. Let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. So he said, okay, what have I got to lose? So they didn't make them eat the Babylonian food or the Babylonian wine. They drank water and they ate the vegetables for 10 days. What does the Bible say was a result after only 10 days of eating God's superfood? Oh, the answer is up here on the screen. And at the end of 10 days, their features appeared bare, better and fatter. Fatter means that they were fuller, they were ready. But don't forget, they had just crossed the desert. And so they filled out fatter and flesh than all the young men who ate from the portion of the king's delicacies. And when they were tested, it says Nebuchadnezzar finally tested them after three years. Listen to what it says about those four young men. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all of the magicians and the astrologers that were in all of his realm. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were ten times smarter, ten times stronger 
They were better than everybody else that had been in that university with them, and they were eating a simple diet. Not only that, that chapter ends by saying Daniel lived until the reign of King Darius or Cyrus. Daniel lived to somewhere near 100 years of age. If we follow God's plan in the Bible, you will live longer and you will live stronger and feel a lot better. Number four, why did Daniel and his friends also refuse to drink the king's wine? Answer, you can read in the Bible, it says wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, it's raging, and whoever is led astray by this is not wise. For you, I hope you don't ever plan on drinking alcohol. It's bad news. You know what the Bible says about those that drink alcohol? 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, nor drunkards will inherit the kingdom of God. Alcohol is a drug. Matter of fact, it is the most deadly drug in North America. But you've all seen wine, you've all seen beer commercials, and they try to make it look like it's fun. Pastor Doug used to drink wine and beer and alcohol, and I got in a lot of trouble. I wrecked cars, I was in jail, nothing but problems. Do you know most of the people that go to the hospital are there because of accidents or sickness connected with alcohol? Most of the people that are in mental institutions are there because of disease or birth defects connected with alcohol. Most of the people that are beaten, children and spouses and families, somebody's been drinking alcohol. And it is a big problem in the world. So Christians shouldn't have anything to do with that. The devil wants to make it look like it's fun. Who is the strongest man in the Bible that ever lived? Samson. Pastor Doug. No, it was Samson. Do you know what the angel said to Samson's mom? You're going to have a baby and you're going to get pregnant now. Be careful what you eat and everything because that baby is going to deliver Israel and when he's born, don't let him drink any wine. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit and when the angel came to talk to his father in the temple, he told him, for he will drink neither wine or strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, when somebody is filled with wine, they're filled with a different kind of spirit. You ever seen a liquor store and it says wine, beer, and spirits? You know why they call it spirits? It's not the Holy Spirit. It's the spirits of devils that come into people when they drink. And so one of the things you want to do is you stay away from drugs, stay away from alcohol, which is a drug, Keep your mind clear. The devil wants a lot of young people today to use drugs so they can't hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Question number five. What was it about the king's food that Daniel knew would defile him? Now there's a reason the king, that Daniel said he couldn't eat the Babylonian food. The Bible said that some food is clean if there were among the animals. Now the Bible doesn't say you have to be a vegetarian, but you'll be a lot better off if you are. But if you're going to eat meat, you can only eat the clean meats. You know, the clean and the unclean distinction of meat it goes all the way back in food, all the way back to Noah. Now, I've got a question. How many of you here are related to Noah? Let me see your hands. Every hand ought to go up. Everybody here. Do you know you're all brothers and sisters? Everyone here is related to Noah because the whole world was destroyed except Noah and his family, right? So everyone here came from Noah. Was Noah Jewish? No, he wasn't. The, the first Jew actually was from the tribe of Judah, or the first Hebrew was Abraham. But we're all related to Noah. But God told Noah when he put the animals on the ark to make a distinction between the animals. He said, you shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, two of the animals that are unclean. So way back in Noah's day, they knew some animals were clean, some animals were unclean. You know what happened after the flood? All the vegetation was destroyed. Man began to eat more animals and probably began to eat the wrong kind of animals. Look at the lifespan. I got a picture up here on the screen. There you've got how long people lived before the flood. You see Noah there in the middle? 950 years. Look what happened to their lifespan after the flood when they started eating more and more animal products, their lifespans got shorter and shorter and shorter. It's pretty well proven now that vegetarians live longer. National Geographic just did an article about that and they interviewed people in Loma Linda because they live longer than most people and the main reason is they don't smoke, they don't drink, and most of them are vegetarians. 
And there was a lady there, 100 years old, that was working out and driving her own car. And so these are facts. God does have superfood in the Bible, and he wants you to know about that because it'll help you feel better. It'll help you be a better witness for him, help you get more done, and you can hear the Holy Spirit. Now, what's the difference between the clean and the unclean mammals? Leviticus 11.3. Whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hoofs and chewing the cud, you can eat. That means an animal like a goat or a sheep, it's got a cloven hoof and it chews the cud. You ever seen animals do that? They're clean to eat. They're vegetarians. But there's some animals, they got a cloven hoof, but they don't chew the cud. It says right there in the Bible, Deuteronomy 14, verse 6, the swine, what's a swine? Pig is unclean for you because it has a cloven hoof, but it does not chew the cud. It shall, you shall not eat their flesh. The Bible says they are an abomination. And there's a lot of people in the world. That man, he's taking his lunch to work with him. A lot of people in the world eat pork. Now, you know, most of the food in the Bible that is unclean, the Bible says that buzzards are unclean. The Bible says skunks are unclean. The Bible says you're not supposed to eat rats and mice. Do you know there are parts of the world where they eat puppy dogs? Do you know in China, they just had the Olympics there? Uh-huh. Do you know that dogs and pigs are related? They're in the same category. Even Jesus used the dog and the pig together. He said they're very similar. Pigs, I understand, make good pets, but you're not supposed to eat them. Even the Muslims know that. The Jews know that, and Christians ought to know that. It's in the Bible that they are... Pigs are garbage cans. God has some animals that are scavengers. They'll eat anything. Has your mother ever come into your room and said, wow, this place, it looks like... It looks like a deer field. They don't ever say it looks like a, a deer meadow. They say it looks like a pig pen, right? You ever, any of you ever heard that before? You know, why? Because what's the dirtiest animal in the world? Pigs. Why would you want to eat the dirtiest animal in the world? They're garbage cans. They eat garbage. And you think, I'd never eat garbage. But if you eat the garbage can, that's even worse, right? God doesn't want us to eat those things that are unclean. Listen to what the Lord says about how he's going to judge people in the last days. Isaiah 66, 15 through 17. Behold, the Lord will come with fire and with a chariot like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury. Those who sanctify themselves and purify themselves, um, eating swine's flesh, now swine is a pig, and the abomination and the, what's that word? Mouse. mouse. He puts pigs and mice in the same category. Would you eat a mouse? No. Shall be consumed together, says the Lord. Now, Pastor Doug knows what he's talking about. You want to see a picture of me? Believe it or not, that's me. Years ago, see what my little car says there? It says, wholesale prime beef, and you can't read the bottom. It said steaks. I used to have my own meat business, and I used to buy all kinds of beef and sell it, and I ate meat three times a day, and I didn't feel very good. When I lived up in the mountains in a cave, I had no refrigerator, so I ate mostly beans and vegetables. I felt pretty good. I felt pretty strong. I came down to town. I went into a meat business. I started to eat lots of steak and meat. and My mind was foggy. I didn't feel very good. I didn't have as much energy. And I asked a friend one day, can I get some prime pork for a customer? He laughed at me. He said, there's no such thing as prime pork. He says, they're all dirty. The U.S. Department of Agriculture says you shouldn't eat it. What about the fish? God makes a distinction in his word between clean and unclean fish. Leviticus 11, verse 9, These you may eat of all that are in the water. Whatever in the water has fins and scales, you might eat. It needed both things, fins and scales. But if it didn't have fins and scales, like uh, crab or clams or lobster or shrimp, the Bible says they're scavengers. All those things you're looking at there, they all live on the bottom. They eat what the other fish drop, and we're not going to talk about what the other fish drop. But they eat that, so why would you want to eat them? That's right, they're, they're scavengers. And then they're not only scavengers like pigs that go around and root things up, and then they got scavengers in the water like catfish and clams, and, and then they got scavengers in the air like buzzards and crows and they're carnivorous animals. The birds, the only birds that people were allowed to eat, the clean birds, were what they called the foraging birds. They're the ones who go around like the little chickens and they pick and they pick up the seeds and like the dove and the quail and the turkey. Uh, those were pheasant, those were foraging birds. The other birds were birds of carrion 
You're not supposed to eat them. Or the raptors, the hunting birds. And it tells every raven after its kind, and the short-eared owl, and the seagull, and the whole hawk after its kind. Those were all considered unclean. Now here's my question for you. Does it make a difference what we eat? It does. What you eat and what you don't eat can make you feel good or not feel good. And you know, the devil clouds the minds of a lot of young people in the world because they're eating the wrong thing. Tell you what, you know, I've got so much to cover, but I want to do a little illustration. Pastor Ross, why don't you help me and bring that table up to me? I've got to get somebody to help me out. Who hasn't helped me yet? I feel you guys are in the middle. Why don't you both come? You haven't, helped, you haven't been up yet? All right, come on, you, you two. Come on up here. Sometimes I always pick them on the edges. All right, I'm going to help you out. See if you find something sweet in there. You, you've already helped. Who has it? You want to come up? You haven't helped yet? Okay. Who hasn't had a turn yet? You haven't had a turn yet? Come on. Sorry. Okay. You find something sweet? Hold that up so we can all see what it is. Look in there. See if there's something else you could drink. Grab that. Put it on the table for me. Okay. All right. You read pretty good? Let me see here. I want you to come here, come here, come here. Let's see here. What does that say right there above my thumb? Sugar. Sugar. How many grams? 31 grams. 31 grams of sugar. And that's per serving. There's two servings in here. So 31 and 31 is? 62 grams of sugar. And if there are about four teaspoons, I'm sorry, there's four grams per teaspoon. Let's see. How many teaspoons would that be? That'd be about 15, is that right? All right. I'd like for you to put 15 teaspoons in here. Y'all count them out for? One, two, three, Is that what you put on your cereal in the morning? I know some of you, you put more on your sugar frosted flakes, don't you? Okay, that's just what's in the candy bar. Now this has got, I, I can't find it here, where is it? So the sugars, 65 grams, isn't that what that says? 65 grams. Tell you what, that's not counting the 50 something grams of 57 milligrams of caffeine phosphoric acid that will clean off battery terminals and some people drink this now we don't have time but uh, why don't you see if you could pour the rest of this sugar in that cup okay I'll bend that for you you think you could pour that in there try and pour it without spilling too much we measured it out in advance. How many of you have drunk one of these before? Ah, oh, don't confess. <laughs> You've never, you probably could never eat one of these by yourself. You know what's amazing to me? You're all starting to act like you already had one. Some of you will eat this and drink that in one sitting. How much sugar are you getting? But it doesn't matter because you always pray over your food, right? <laughs> as long as you pray over it, it'll be okay? No, yeah. oh, no. You know, thank you very much. You can go back down. Pastor Ross might get this for me. The Bible says, God is not mocked. Do not be deceived. What a person sows, they will also reap. And there are some people that think it doesn't matter. I'll just pray over it. It does matter. There's something called cause and effect. And what you do, it's going to make a difference. You've got to be careful. A lot of kids are eating so much sugar, they're just like this at school and they're not doing very well. I know because I grew up and sometimes for breakfast all I had was a hostess Twinkie and, and a cup of coffee. And then I wondered why I did so poorly in school. And if you eat good food, the Bible says eat what is good. Do you know why there's sin in the world today? God told Adam and Eve not to, not to eat something they weren't supposed to eat. Did they listen? No. He told Eve, 
thou shalt not eat of it. And they did eat of it. Question number six. Why does God say all these things about our food? It says the Lord commanded us to observe all of these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive. He cares about us, right? Can you have a banana split and then go to school and think everything's going to be okay? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. Uh, and hopefully your mom and dad won't let you do that. It says in the Bible, eat that which is good. Now some people say, you know, these people that believe in evolution, they say people are supposed to eat meat because after all, right here you got a tooth. Pastor Doug has all his own teeth. See that? I bought them with my own money. <laughs> we got these canine teeth, and they say that's, that means you're supposed to eat flesh because you got these canine teeth. This fella here, he's got pretty good canine teeth too, don't you think? <laughs> but you know what? He's a vegetarian. He's one of the strongest animals, and he's a vegetarian. Elephant's the biggest animal. He's a vegetarian. Giraffe's the tallest animal. He's a vegetarian. These animals know about their superfood. And so this idea that you've got to eat meat or you've got to eat all these sweet things or you're just not going to feel good, it's not true. You will feel much better if you follow God's diet. Number seven, what should guide me in choosing how I live and what I eat? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, that was our scripture verse to start with. Whether you eat or whether you drink, do all to the glory of God. All right, I need some more helpers here. I'm going to go to this side now. Tell you what, we'll just go right down the line here. One, you want to help again? One, two, three, four, five, six. Come up real quick. We're running out of time. Do you all know how to break these and shake them? Yeah. Take one, break it, shake it real quick. Now, I hope this works. Hey, someone missing one? Yeah. Here. Shake, shake it, break it. Okay, here we go. What does a red light mean at a traffic sign? Stop. What does a green light mean? Go. And yellow light means? Caution. Well, one time a kid said it means go real fast. <laughs> because so many people, parents, they see the lights turn yellow, they go, because they want to get through the light. All right, come here. All right, all two red lights together. Let me help you with this. Oh, good. I thought you had a dead there for a minute. All right. All right, yellow, where's the yellow? Yellow over here, two yellows. Reds, you guys stand together, two greens, you stand together. All right, some foods are perfectly good and God wants you to enjoy them. Now I'm gonna call out a food, you tell me, red, green, or yellow? Red. I haven't said a food yet. <laughs> Bananas. Yellow. Green. green, hold up your light, green light. Green. Bananas are good. Grapes. Green, green. green light. Ice cream. Yellow, come on. God says he's taking us to a land of milk and honey, right? Yeah. A little bit. Yellow means caution. Coca-Cola. Red. Red light. Red light. I hope I don't get sued for this. Coffee. Red. Oh, red light. Very good. Alcohol. Red. Strawberries. Zucchini. Red. <laughs> Some of you said red. <laughs> Broccoli. Green. That's right. Let me think what else we could say here. Potato chips. Red. Yellow. All right. You get the idea? So, pork. Red. Bacon. Red. Did you know bacon is pork? <laughs> Ham. <laughs> All right, very good. You get the idea. Thank you. We're running out of time. You can keep those, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll have surprises for you. Don't worry. I'm just about out of time, and I got more to say. Maybe some of you will ask questions about health, but God wants you to feel good. You know, when Jesus comes back, He's going to give us new glorified bodies. But we need to take care of these bodies, right? What would you think if somebody said they wanted to borrow your family's brand new car? Yeah, don't play with them now. Don't play with our light sticks. 
They wanted to borrow your family's brand new car, and they said, I'll bring it back in a week. And you, they're a friend, you said, okay. So they take your car on vacation, and they go, and they go driving off through the wilderness, and they don't even use the road, and they beat the thing up, and they scrape it against trees, and they don't check the oil, they don't put water in the radiator, and they put the wrong gas in the tank. And after a week, they come, you hear this noise coming up the street. And you look out there, and you see this monstrosity come driving towards you. <laughs> And there's sparks flying out from underneath it because the tires are worn off and it's driving on the rims. And smoke is billowing out from underneath the hood. And they pull up and they open the door and it falls off. And the headlight's hanging out like an eyeball. And they, <laughs> they, they say, where's my car? They say, oh, this is your car. Hey, thanks a lot. We had a lot of fun on vacation. <laughs> and they say, can we borrow it again next year? What would you say? No. If they do that to the one you lent them, then you don't want to ever lend them another one. Who does your body belong to? How many of you want a new body when Jesus comes? Do you think he's going to give you a new body if you destroy the, well, if you destroy the one he's given you? You need to take care of your body, not only to honor God because it's his property, but you'll feel better and you'll live longer. I'm a grandfather. Did you know that? I can walk on my hands. You want to see me walk on my hands? Yeah. Ow, it hurts though, but I'll do it again if you want. <laughs> I got to do this real quick. We're almost out of time. <laughs> okay. That's all I can do. For our friends who are watching, we still got one more question left. It's got, number eight, a bunch of secrets about health so you could live longer and stronger. Look at those things. You can also find out more about it at the Amazing Facts website. Don't you all want to feel better and live longer and be stronger? Yeah. God has superfood for you if you follow the rules in the Bible. Let's ask him to help us do that. Amen? Can we pray right now? Let's ask the Lord to help us. We need to make some changes in the way we eat and drink so that we bring glory to him. Father in heaven, thank you for the principles you give us in your word so we can know how we can bring glory to you by taking care of our bodies. Give us victory and self-control. Be with all those that are watching so that we might have more strength to give you glory and to take care of ourselves and be better witnesses. In Jesus' name, amen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1 The English word Genesis is derived from the Greek word Genesis, which means beginning. And so the book of Genesis is a book about beginnings. The book describes the creation, the fall of man, and the beginning of biblical history. Our focus is to discuss God and his acts of creation as described in Genesis 1 and 2, how God went about creating and why. Genesis 1 and 2 details the two different accounts and both chapters reveal two different names of God, the Creator. Genesis 1 presents God as Elohim. The name speaks of the supremacy of God who is above humans. Elohim denotes superiority and strength and use of the plural form of Elohim expresses the idea of majesty, transcendence. In Genesis 2, the second creation account, the name Yahweh, Lord God, appears. Yahweh is described through the verbs used in his acts of creating humanity. He formed, he breathed, he planted or established a garden, and he tenderly placed them, alphabets, in that beautiful environment. And so Yahweh God denotes interaction, relationship, 
a God who is up close and personal. He entered into his creation. Who is this Elohim? Who is Yahweh? John chapter 1 verse 1, 2 and 3 reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Therefore, Genesis is about Jesus. Jesus is our Creator. Jesus is our sustainer, and ultimately, in time, Jesus is our Redeemer and coming King. Jesus captures the Elohim of Genesis 1 and the Yahweh of Genesis 2 when He became man, and He was called Emmanuel. God with us. God created us in His image, His likeness wherein we became living souls. And the Hebrew words, slam, image, refers to the concrete shape of the physical body. And the word demut, likeness, refers to the abstract qualities that are comparable to the divine person. These two words, God's image and God's likeness, totally destroys the theory of evolution process, beginning from a simple inferior uh, substance and existence to a superior one over millions of years. God's acts of creation was finished. It was completed, it was very good. And the seventh day Sabbath celebrated that finished work. These two chapters, on creation are joined together by God resting, God blessing, and God sanctifying the seventh day. By divine design, the Sabbath is the highlight of creation, made for the single purpose of worshiping and fellowshipping with God. And thus these two descriptions of God describes us to the ultimate purpose of creation, to worship Him. We will find our true joy in His presence. And He, God, will find His ultimate consolation and rest with us. The Sabbath contains God's ultimate purpose for the creation of mankind. The Sabbath is the heartbeat of His creation every week. A weekly temple of time, a time of worship and fellowship with our Creator and Savior and God. That was Adam and Eve's experience in the garden. It can be ours now in our fallen state. And one day, face to face again in the earth made new. While science seeks to understand this world without God, Genesis is revealing the God who created it and why. And because Genesis tells us of a meaningful beginning, Therefore, there is a meaningful present and there will be a meaningful end. Hello, I'm Shelley Quinn. We welcome you to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. This quarter, we will be studying Genesis, a book that has so much to impart to us, and we're glad that you've, you're joining us. If you don't already have your adult Bible study guide, please go to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. Dot com. There you can download the guide and you can even watch some of the previous quarters. So we're glad you're here. We do this for you. Let's have a good time in the study of the Word today. Oh, we are all studied up and ready to share with you lesson one 
from our new quarterly, Genesis. This is called The Creation. Let me introduce you to our panel members. To my left, I have Pastor John Lomacain. Good to be able to study from the very beginning, the genesis of the understanding of God's Word. Amen. Evangelist Ryan Day. Amen. One of my favorite books, the book of Genesis. Definitely be studying what it means, which is the origins, the beginning. Amen. And Pastor of... Kenny Shelton. Amen. Always delight to study the Word of God together. I always learn so much from each and every one and uh, praise God for the opportunity. Hey, well, we're glad you're here. And then Sister Jill Marconi, how many takeaways do you have today? <laughs> <laughs> Ten takeaways for today. Ten. But I'm excited to open up the Word of God and study. Oh, me Amen. too. Me too. John, would you like to have a prayer, please? Sure. Loving Father in heaven, as we open your word, you've said to us, in the beginning was the word. Then you said, let there be light. And mm -hmm. Lord, today we ask for the same thing. Let the light that you uh, reveal to us be revealed through us to those who are seeking to walk in the light of your word. And may all the glory go only to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yes. The beauty of Genesis is that it reveals the origin of humankind. It reveals the origin of time and biblical history. I want to give you an overview of Genesis. That's what I was impressed to do as I was preparing because Genesis lays the theological foundation for some very important points First, God is Father, Son, and Spirit. Humankind, sin and death. God's covenant promises of redemption, of blessings and judgments. It introduces God's covenant people and God's character. We will see that the more sin abounds, the more God's grace abounds mm -hmm. to a people that were willfully disobedient. Mm -hmm. But it also lays a foundation of a theological foundation for Satan and angels. Our memory text is in the beginning. This is Genesis 1-1. This is how the Bible starts. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Mm. Now, this word God is Elohim. The Bible says in the New Testament, in John 1, 1 through 4, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. Mm -hmm. And he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life. His life was the light of men. And verse 14 of John chapter 1 says, he became a man. He mm -hmm. tabernacled among us. Mm -hmm. And so we know that Jesus Christ is the creator. Mm -hmm. He was there in the beginning. So mm -hmm. really when we look at Genesis, it is about Jesus as our creator, our sustainer. You know, Hebrews 1 30 says that he upholds everything by his mighty word of power and our redeemer. Mm -hmm. Genesis is the beginning of God's progressive unfolding of his everlasting covenant. And it is introduced in Genesis 3.15. And you know what? The whole story is not completely unfolded till we reach Revelation 22.22. 22. Genesis was written after the Exodus. It was written by Moses after the Exodus, but sometime before his death. And God had him write the history of creation, the primitive history of mankind, and the patriarchal history of his chosen people. Genesis ends with the death of Joseph, about 280 years before Moses was born. But it's important to note both the Old Testament and the New Testament refer to Moses as the author. It's quoted or alluded to hundreds of times in the Old Testament, Genesis is, but it's quoted over 35 times in the New Testament. So the contents of Genesis are divided into two primary parts. There's chapters 1 through 11 and then chapters 12 through 50. 1 through 11 condenses, distills 2,000 years of history into 
it's just a, a sweeping overview of history in those 11 chapters. Mm -hmm. And what we see there is the creation of a perfect world, a perfect man. We see the fall of man. We see the flood. Then we see the dispersion of the nations. And what we see also is that Genesis relates to Revelation. Mm -hmm. In Genesis, there's the paradise lost, Re Revelation, paradise regained. Yeah. In Genesis, there is the fall of mankind, the curse of sin. In Revelation 22, 3 says, there will no longer be a curse. Mm -hmm. In Genesis, they're banned from the tree of life. But in Revelation, we find that robed in Christ's righteousness, mm -hmm. we are once again eating from the tree of life. So let's see Genesis 12 through 50. This is the patriarchal history, the history of, and, and this is important because you'll see why it's so important to us, the history of Abraham. God actually introduced, reaffirmed, and uh, he, he confirmed his everlasting covenant with Abraham, passed on to Jacob, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph. So what we're going to look at in, in Genesis 1 through 11 is in Mesopotamia. Genesis uh, 12 through 50 is in Canaan and the Promised Land. So here's the fascinating thing, and it puts everything into perspective. The Bible records 4,100 years of history. Do you realize over 2,300 years are recorded in Genesis? Why is that important? Wow. And in the beginning, the first verse, when it says God created, the word there is bara mm -hmm. in the Hebrew. And you know what that means? He created something from nothing. That's bara right. is never used with mankind. It is a word that is only assigned to God. So Sunday, the God of creation, and oh, I've got to rush. Moses when, when Moses is introducing God, you know what? He doesn't even try to defend or explain God's origin or his character. He just knows both are by faith and he gets with it. But there's two different Genesis accounts and they spotlight two different uh, ideas of God or of his character. The first account is found in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 4, when it says, in the beginning, God created. It's Elohim created. This is the transcendent God whose eternal existence is beyond our material universe. And his name, this name is majesty and preeminence. But when we get to the second account in Genesis 2, 4 through 25, let's look at Genesis 2, 4. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God, this is not Elohim, this is God's covenant name, Yahweh. In that day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. So this name denotes an imminent God. Mm -hmm. And, I, and that, there's two words for imminent and people sometimes don't realize the second word, I M M. A-N-E-N-T is talking about God's imminence, His presence around us, that He is up close and personal. Yeah. And it creates, I guess you could say, it makes us acknowledge our dependence on mm -hmm. God. So in this twofold, just these two names, we see the majestic, powerful God and a God who is close and loving and wants us in personal relationship. Now, when we look at Genesis, where am I? <laughs> when, when we look at Psalm 100, verses 1 through 3, when we see there is that it says, make a joyful shout to the Lord mm. all ye lands, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Mm. 
Amen. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us and not we ourselves. We are His sheep, His people, and the sheep of His pasture. So Genesis is going to explain to us where we came from. Mm -hmm. God created us mm -hmm. in His image. Mm -hmm. God created us to have that covenant relationship with Yahweh, mm -hmm. Jehovah God. He wants, He, he was increasing the size of His family, I guess mm -hmm. you could say, when He created us. But this also shows us why we're here. Mm -hmm. We're here to have that personal, close relationship with our Lord. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, when you look through and you see Elohim, the one who existed forever, mm -hmm. and then we see Yahweh, that one who existed forever, his personal name, Jehovah, that he wants us. It's all about grace. Mm -hmm. It's all about grace. We are only here because of God's grace. He mm -hmm. created this beautiful world. Then he set man in this world. And then we're going to see as we go through Genesis that God is a God of redemption. Mm -hmm. This It is such an important part. And this too, redemption is a gift of God's grace. Mm -hmm. So we pray that as we go through this, don't think, oh, I've heard this, this story before mm -hmm. in my Sabbath school or my Sunday school, wherever you go for Bible studies. What we want you to do is listen because we're going to bring out points that you may never have thought of. It's like we're peeling an onion and we're getting down, or better say an artichoke. We're peeling off the leaves of an artichoke till we get to the heart of the matter. And it is the heart of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Praise Praise the Lord. Yeah. Well, we have started in the Genesis of the Genesis and mine is Creation Monday. Mm. Now, creation is something that um, all Christians, I believe, should believe in creation. Right. Mm -hmm. I've been surprised to find out the different theories that are coming out of what people may believe and at the very same time saying they believe in creation. Creation is a record that, uh, as a matter of fact, you can find seven days in no other place in the world. You can find it in the stars, the sun, the moon, the cycles of time, it can only be found in the story of creation. Mm. And you find that at the end of the six creation days, this phrase, it was good, mm. and God saw that mm. it was good. Yeah. We yeah. find that a continual cadence throughout the story of creation in the book of Genesis chapter one. But the tenure goes to another level when creation is completed. Let's go to Genesis one and verse 31. God's observation escalates to another level when creation is completed. Well. Genesis 1 verse 31. Mm. Then God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was together. Very good. Very good. So the evening and the morning were the six days. We find that phrase evening and morning six times. We find the word day 10 times. And that is not, uh, there are some that believe that um, the days were uh, a thousand years long, and they try to cite uh, with the Lord a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. And there's some religions that believe the day was broken up into 500 year segments. Well, you can't even test the theory because no plant life could exist for 500 years in darkness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the word there makes it very clear, evening, morning, evening, morning. Yeah. The cycles of time that God established in creation continues to exist today, even though sin now inhabits our world. Now, Genesis 2, verse 1 to 3, which Ryan is going to be dealing with the Sabbath. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to mention the text, but I'm not going to deal with the topic of the Sabbath. But we find that on the heels of creation, the affirmation of God's work is brought about in the verses in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. 
Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. And he did that to no other day. And I can't wait to hear what you have to say about the Sabbath. But the question that was asked by the writer of the lesson is what is implied, what is the implied lesson contained in the conclusion of creation? Mm -hmm. Here are some of the things I came out with. Well. What you find is that every step of the creation, God evaluates his own work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now that's powerful. God evaluates. And at the end of the day, he said, it was good. Right. He continues to evaluate, which is the general understanding. The Hebrew word there is T-O-V, tov, meaning good. Right. So at the end of every day, God said it was tov, it was good. Right. Generally understanding that the succession of creation was the observation that when the Lord created what he did on each day, it was good. Then another word there meaning it worked. Mm. <laughs> it worked. Yes. So, <laughs> so when, when you look at the Hebrew word, it doesn't just mean it, it's good. It means it worked. So what God did on every day, it's still working today. Amen. Amen. And it hasn't changed. <laughs> now, what's wonderful about that, James 1.17 says yes. this to us. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. So the very, the very word good, 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 continually at the end of every creation day is reemphasized by James. That's what happens when God is involved. Everything good comes from him. Genesis 1 verse 4, the Bible starts with the illumination. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And he called the light day and he called the darkness night. Yes. Now, this is something that I'd like to develop at a different time because people said, wait a minute, but the sun and the moons were not yet created, which says to God, you don't need a sun and a moon to have light. Amen. God created the, the existence of light and the sun and the moon were to govern mm. the light not to produce the light. Mm -hmm. The sun and the moon were there to govern the day, govern the night, but not to produce it. God already produced it. We also go to the plant life, Genesis 1 verse 12. The plants were yielding fruit mm -hmm. and the earth brought forth grass, the herb, of the, the herb that yields fruit according to its kind and the trees that yield fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind and God saw that it was good. Now, when you look at the progression of creation, it radically contradicts the theories of evolution, mm -hmm. which, dog, which dogmatically declares that everything happened eventually. The way I wrote it down was uh, evolution talks about a progressive creation, a successive creation that happened on the heels of an accidental explosion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How could such order mm -hmm. come out of such mm -hmm. chaos? Yes. Now, an astrophysicist by the name of Neil deGrasse Tyson I don't agree with much of what he says, but this phrase, he really pulled it off when he said, and I apply this to those who believe in evolution, how strange he's one of the believers. But what he says actually denies the very things he espouses. He says, one of the greatest challenges in life is knowing enough to think you're right, but not enough to know you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happened to evolutionists today are saying that the evidences of a God who created the world is missing. Well, you got to know what the evidence is that's missing to know it's missing. Well, but they can't produce when you ask what's missing. They can't tell you what's missing. Mm -hmm. Well, the fact of the matter is they're trying to find God and God cannot be found by humanity. Mm -hmm. Good news. Humanity can be found by God. Amen. 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 The biblical record points it out very clearly. And Shelley mentioned this in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. How did he do it? Psalm 33, verse six and nine. Mm -hmm. By the word of the Lord, That's right. the heavens were made Amen. and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together mm -hmm. as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouse Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and mm -hmm. it stood fast. Only God can create. Yeah. And I, I love the way you use that word when talking about Elohim. When God created Barak meant he created out of nothing. That's right. Now we can't create anything out of nothing. That's right. Mm -hmm. We can say a lot of nothing, but we can't create anything out of nothing. Right. What you said meant nothing, right. mm -hmm. but it came from something. It came from a mind devoid of understanding. Mm -hmm. We did not become, the other part is we did not become humans. Mm -hmm. We were created 
humans. Amen. Mm. Mm. Humanity did not evolve into human. That's right. How God made creation in the very beginning is how it continues to this very day. Obviously, sin has interrupted the perfection of it. But Genesis 1 verse 26 talks about this, the perfection of the creation of humankind. Verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion, dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, mm -hmm. and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Mm -hmm. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. Yeah. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So when creation was done, male and female we're here. Mm -hmm. We yeah. did not evolve out of an amoeba, then a oh. paramecium that sprung legs and mm. crawled out of a swampy pond, then at, over the course of billions of years stood up and became a monkey, that became an ape, that became oh. a man, that became a woman. You can't get, I don't want to be, I don't want to be cynical here, well, no. but if you've seen how wonderful people look, mm -hmm. don't contribute the beauty of a human. Come on the handsomeness of a man and the beauty of a woman to a monkey. That's mm. right. It doesn't oh. match. Mm. It doesn't even make any sense. Mm. And that will buy, by the way, that's why people behave the way they do. Yeah. You know, the same is also true about the creation of animals. Animals did not evolve into what they are today. If that were the case, then how did the monkey stop evolving? We have other animals that people have said have come from monkeys or come from apes, but apes and monkeys still exist. So you see the theory is ridiculous. That's why Genesis 1 verse 24, the Bible says, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. It worked. Mm -hmm. And it's still working today. So you find in the Bible also the six, six references to the evening and the morning denotes that there was a cycle of time. Each day had a beginning and an end. And Genesis 1 verse 6 talks about the beginning and the end of those days. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Now in evolution, the theory is the Big Bang unleashed a creative process that took millions of years to get to where we are today. Mm -hmm. But the evidence that there was nothing more to be created is the word finished. Mm -hmm. When God finished it, it was finished. Mm -hmm. There was nothing evolutionary to show up after God said it was finished. Mm -hmm. It was so finished, he said it was very good. If creation was not finished, the seventh day could not exist. That's right. That's right. Chew on that for a moment. If creation was not yet done, yeah. the seventh day could not continue to exist. The seventh day is the capstone right. of the creation week. And in just a moment, Ryan's going to take charge of that Sabbath day. Amen. I just have to add one point. You know, there's no way that geologists can date our earth because God created everything with apparent age. Adam and Eve weren't little babies. They were grown people. Plants, trees were grown. Right. So, oh, God's Word is perfect. We'll be back in just 30 seconds. Stay tuned. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Now we will continue our study for Tuesday with Ryan Day. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm Ryan Day and I have Tuesday's lesson and it's entitled The Sabbath. Yeah. And uh, I'm so, so blessed to have this lesson because, you know, the Sabbath message, the truth of the Sabbath, the blessing of the Sabbath has just changed my life. I wasn't always and haven't always been a Sabbath keeper according to uh, the biblical message. God showed that to me later in, in life as an, in an, as an early adult, a young adult. And uh, it has just tremendously changed my life for the better. Yeah. And so I, wanna, I don't want to take much time. I want to jump right into the text because actually Tuesday's lesson dives us right into Genesis chapter 2. Mm -hmm. 
And I want to thank Pastor Loma King and Shelly for giving us a great setup mm -hmm. for this uh, because now we get to talk about the capstone of Creation Week, uh, God's beautiful rest day. So Genesis chapter 2, we're going to read verses 1 through 3 and notice what the Bible says. Genesis chapter 2 verses 1 through 3 says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. Mm. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Mm. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it, he had rested from all his work, which he had created and made. And I just have to emphasize this because there may be someone watching right now that has never heard this truth, never heard the truth about the Sabbath. The beautiful thing to note here, which we often like to bring out, is that when you're studying this beautiful creation week. God is doing this like a painter on a beautiful canvas. He's just doing all of this beautiful work on each and every creation day. Just all of this beautiful creation on each and individual day. But by the time he gets to the seventh day, he does three things as this text just brought out. Three things on the seventh day that he did not do on any of the previous creation days. And so now when he gets to the Sabbath, he rests. That's the first thing. He rests. He, and the word there is Shabbat. He rests. He's Sabbath. That's where we get the word Sabbath from. He rested. He he blessed the seventh day. Now, it's not to say that the other days aren't a blessing, right? Uh, every day should be a blessing. But on that particular day, God placed a special blessing mm -hmm. on this seventh day. And now, uh, the third thing, of course, is that he sanctified it. He made it holy. He set it apart. He sanctified it. And that's what sanctified means. It's he set it apart mm -hmm. for a holy use. He set it apart from the other six. He said, look, these are the days that I worked. These are the days that I created. I'd done my labor. But the seventh day is now set apart part for a holy use. It's declared holy. It's a holy day. And when God makes something holy, holy. how are you going to reverse that? Right. You can't reverse that whatsoever. So mm -hmm. this is why we should be emphasizing and bringing out the blessing and the holiness, the sanctity of the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. And we know that this continues on. God's commandments, including the Sabbath commandment, continues on for creation. And I've even had people say, you know, Ryan, you know, the Sabbath doesn't really come along until the commandments in Mount Sinai. But we know that the commandments predate <laughs> Sinai because we see right there in the 20 sixth chapter mm. of Genesis, which we'll get to when we talk about Abraham and how Abraham was obedient to all of God's commandments and to God's voice. Even in the 16th chapter of Exodus, we see the Sabbath. God saying, how long do you refuse to keep my laws? And this was before he had given the Decalogue or the, the formal uh, Ten Commandments on the tablets of stone. And so the Sabbath has always been a blessing since creation. And he wants all of his, mm. all of his people to, to participate in that blessing. Now let's go read the command itself because mm. uh, as we often call these the Ten Commandments, they're really, and, and we've said this often as well, and I just want to emphasize it, it's the Ten Freedoms. God is setting His people free from 400 years of bondage in Egypt, and He's saying, look, I want to now give you the freedom to rest on my holy day. Work six days, yes, but rest on my holy day. And so he emphasizes the, the significance of the Sabbath in Exodus chapter 20, mm -hmm. verses 8 through 11. Exodus 20, mm -hmm. verses 8 through 11. This is the Sabbath commandment. God is verbally speaking this and he tells them, remember mm -hmm. the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Mm -hmm. In it you shall not do no work, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, yeah. or your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. Yeah. And then he tells us why we keep it holy. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that in them is, mm -hmm. and rested the seventh day. Yeah. Therefore the Lord blessed uh, the Sabbath day and hallowed it. I love it. The first yeah, verse there in, in verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The general command, God wants us to remember it. He wants mm -hmm. us to honor it. He wants us yeah. to keep it holy. How do we do that? Verses 9 and 10, we rest and allow others to rest in our control, within our gates, within our property. Yeah. If we have control over that, we should rest and we should allow others to receive the blessing of rest. And then of course, why do we keep the Sabbath holy? Not just because God's just trying to put some oppressive, like you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't. Mm. A lot of people see the, uh, the Sabbath as a, as a curse or as a, as, a, as a heavy drudgery that they can't do all of these things. But God says, no, 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 it's much more, it's farther beyond just the rest aspect. 
It's a memorial of creation. Mm, that's right. Jesus, it's, when we, we keep the Sabbath holy, we're remembering God's creative work, his amazing creative work, and him as the creator of the universe. It's all right there, even in the yeah. general commandment. And, and you know, the Sabbath, the, the lesson brings us out. I'm going to read this portion here because this is really, really nice. The Sabbath is also a way in which we, it's a reminder in which we can take care of our, ourselves, our bodies, our lives. Yeah, Notice what the, yeah. the lesson brings here, and I have to read this. It says, mm -hmm. We can rest from our works just as God had rested from his. Sabbath keeping means saying yes to God's very good creation, which includes our physical bodies. Contrary to some ancient and modern beliefs, nothing in scripture, Old or New Testament, uh, denigrates the body as evil. And so it goes on to say that's a pagan concept, not a biblical one. Mm -hmm. Instead, Sabbath keepers are grateful for God's creation, mm -hmm. which includes their own flesh, right? And that is why they can enjoy the creation and what they uh, and why they take care of it. We are we are the we are the uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and the Bible makes that very clear. And we need that rest. The the, the Sabbath rest is a, is a delight. It should be a joy. Mm -hmm. It's a way for us to to re-energize and to take a pause from our busy life and to be able to get that spiritual and physical rest that we need each and every, uh, each and every mm. week. It's a sign, the Sabbath, I love this too, it's beautiful. It's a sign of hope for suffering humanity Ooh, and for right. the groaning of the world. Now this comes obviously post-fall, right? We've, you know, sin enters the world, but each and every week now that we're living in the sinful world, it's a reminder uh, that, that it's a sign of hope for suffering humanity. Mm. We even see this within the context of, you know, right there in the beginning of creation, week, it says God finished his work. He mm. finished his work. Uh, but then you see the same phrasing, same words that are used in Exodus chapter 40, verse 33, when Moses, they finished building the sanctuary, the mm. tabernacle. We see it again within the context of the sanctuary and first. Kings chapter 7 verses 40 and 51 doing the building of Solomon's temple or we call it Solomon's temple it's the Lord's temple but nonetheless we see it very clearly there that in the in the finishing of that work the blessing of the Sabbath is a reminder mm -hmm. it points us to salvation and redemption and the fact that when you think of the sanctuary message it's progressive Yes. And the progressive right. message of the, of the salvation message in the sanctuary is leading us to a time when we have mm. when we will have eternal oh. spiritual rest in mm. God. It's progressively leading us to the very presence of God, where we can right. dwell with Him, and we no longer have to have these degraded, dying bodies. Mm. But when we rest each week in the Sabbath, mm. it points forward to the beautiful blessing uh, uh, of the hope that we have that God is going to make things new. Yeah. Uh, after the fall, the Sabbath at the end of the week points to the miracle of salvation as we brought out, which will take place, notice, only through the miracle of a new creation, which we see in Isaiah 65, mm. verse 17, as well That's as right. Revelation chapter 21, we see the new heaven and the new earth. Mm. The Sabbath is a sign, it's a symbol of mm. hope. Mm. We look forward, when we, when we keep the Sabbath holy and we honor it according to the Bible, we're also remembering the fact and honoring the fact of the beautiful promise and hope that we have that That's God right. is going to come back and He's going to make all things new. Powerful, yeah. powerful truth. Yes. The Sabbath is a sign at the end of our human week that the suffering and trials of this world mm. will have an end yeah. as well. There's so much more. My time's clicking away here. There's so much more that we can highlight here. I had a whole section that I'm not going to be able to read. Uh, but you know, this all, the, all of this truth, and I'm going to end on this, all of this truth is also uh, emphasized and very clearly communicated in the fact that Jesus cares for suffering humanity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He cares for our groanings. Mm -hmm. In fact, the lesson brings out that Jesus chose the Sabbath as the most appropriate day to do all of, mm -hmm. his, all of his healing. Mm -hmm. and, and there's so many different scriptural examples of this, but Luke 13, which I'm not going to have time to read these verses, but Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17, we see very clearly there, there's a lady with, with, with an infirmity there, mm -hmm. and Jesus heals her on the Sabbath. And what are the, what are the synagogue rulers? It says, it says there in verse 14, but the ruler mm -hmm. of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus Jesus had healed on the Sabbath and he said to the crowd, there are six days in which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath. Mm. Jesus rebukes these brothers and he mm. goes on to say, you hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead it away to water? Mm -hmm. So ought not this woman be of the daughter of Abraham whom Satan had bound? Think of it for 18 years, be loosed on the bond, loosed of this bond on the Sabbath. Jesus said it's better to do good on the Sabbath 
Sabbath. Why? Yes. Because He is Lord of the Sabbath. Amen. My friends, a Sabbath is a blessing. We Amen. should receive it as an exquisite delight. Yes. And I hope that you also in your studies learn that it can be a blessing for you. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. Okay, we're going to go right into Wednesday's lesson, but boy, you guys have really set it up. We're going to go to Wednesday's lesson. It's going to be talking about the creation of humanity. Uh, to me, it's just, to me, it was awesome just to go back and to be refreshed and to learn some things about creation. If you have your Bibles, be sure to turn with me, Genesis chapter 1. I think a couple of these verses have been read, but I want to read them again just in case you missed it. So we set up a, a good foundation. Genesis chapter 1, 26, 27, and 28. Okay. These will be very familiar verses that most of you probably have memorized. The Bible says, I love to say that, the Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image and in our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, over the, all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Notice verse 28. It says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Well, I like the way it starts out. Verse 26, God said, He said, Let us make. Let us make now man in our image. And so you look at that word image, it's, 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 it's quite a, a challenging word, but yet it has some real depth and meaning to it. When you say image there, it's talking about the knowledge. God gave man knowledge and, you know, where he could reason things out. It has to do with righteousness. It has to do with true holiness. And I'd like to add something here. To me, it's, 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 it's happiness. You know, because in the very beginning, before sin, I think people, we've mentioned that before sin, Adam and Eve, you know, they were holy beings and they were happy Amen. beings. Right. God Amen. said, let's make man in our image. So man was made inter interesting. Man was made last, <laughs> right, of all the creatures. And now, now I know why. I finally figured this one out so that we could look up uh, scriptures like Job chapter 38, verse 4. I know I'm funning you a little bit, but notice what it says. What does it say? This is going to fit. It says, Where wast thou when I laid the foundation right. of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. To me, that makes sense, yeah. right? Man can't get, when there's a little discussion there between Job and God, we realize God's simply pointing to all of us, and he did to man and said, No, where were you? Right. right? All of this stuff is, was made before you got here. That's right. Yeah. Everything your little heart desires is here for you. Uh, his ways are past finding out. I think in Romans eleven thirty three, his ways are past finding out. Yet men tr men try, but you know we, we we can't find out God. We can't find out all these things. But praise God, He's left enough that we can understand, and and certainly He can find us. As soon as man was created, He had everything. I know everything that He wanted, because it was pretty much done. Right. So now the, the, uh, something else I want to bring out. I said, let us make man. Just, just a quick points here. Let us make man. What is it talking about? Three persons of the Godhead. Mm -hmm. You know, again, a subject that a lot of people would want to debate and want to go. Three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. They counseled together. They consulted together. They came in agreement together. And then man was, man was made. He was created. And he was to be, why? Because he was to be dedicated and he was to be uh, devoted to those three. Mm. Kind of interesting, right? We devoted tendency toward these things. I thought it was just beautiful thought when you think about God said. You know, a story I think about, and I just have to bring it up, and many people have done this, I'm sure, but I think when uh, Russia, when 3ABN was having their meetings there, because we talked about creation of man, we're talking about, uh, you know, evangelism, which is you know, people's talk about evangelism, the words going out, praise God. He was a man that was trying to find God, was he not? Do you remember the story? Trying to find God. He didn't have a Bible. He never read in the Word of God. He had no idea, but he was there at the meetings and a free Bible was passed out to him. And so he opened the first page and he read, in the beginning was God. Tears begin to just flow down his cheeks. Mm. That's what I've been wanting to know all of my life, and now I know. Man, Amen. what faith. That's right. If we would just do that, Amen. like this man did, this gentleman, 
take the Bible, open it up, and begin to read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So what a thought. God created. Notice that's a thought. God created the world first, right? And then he put man in charge of this world. Right. And after reading these verses, I jotted down a few, few questions, you know, that why did God create the world? Why did he do it? Mm. Well, here's just a few reasons. Manuscript 78, this is in 1901, says, infinite love. How great it is. Mm. God made the world, I think Shelley might mention this or alluded to it, to enlarge what? Yeah. Enlarge heaven. We desire a larger family of what? Or he desired a larger family of created intelligence. Mm. That's right. Man, That's there's good. a reason why. Number two, God made man for his own glory. Mm. You know, again, how's your life working out? Are we, you know, glory to, to, to God or maybe to the world? Three, God's purpose was to repopulate you know, heaven with the human family, mm. right? Mm. Man sinned, he fell, fell short, God repopulated the earth, and they are to, uh, ha that'd be after test and after trial for sure. Review in Herald 2, 1902 says this, I like this because I sensed, as I read it, an, a nearness that heaven is to us, how near God wants to be to us and how important that all the universe has it. They're interested in you and they're interested in me. It says all of heaven took a deep, I like this, joyful interest in the creation of the world and of man. Human beings, notice this, were a new and distinct order. They were made in the image of God. So only human beings then were created in the image of God. Four words just kind of stuck out to me, and I'll, I'll tell them to you quickly as I can. Image, likeness, formed, and breathe. Mm -hmm. Image, number one, is re refers to the shape of the physical body. Likeness refers to the, I want to call it the abstract or, right? Is it, this is in a loose way, right? This is kind of in a loose way compared to the divine. <laughs> the biblical text it, in the image of God is both physically and spiritually spiritually, as in the book Education 15 says this. Listen to this quote. When Adam came from the Creator's hand, he bore in his physical, mental, and spiritual nature a likeness to his Maker. Mm -hmm. How awesome, really to think about how awesome that really is, mm -hmm. that God's going to create, He creates man, and He puts man in, in our likeness. Mm -hmm. Wow. Another purpose why God created the earth and, of course, man. I found this in Adventist home, page uh, 540. God's original purpose in the creation of the earth is fulfilled in that it, it made the eternal abode of the redeemer. I pay for the redeemed. This is where it's going to be. And these redeemed are going to be free from sin and sorrow. So that's one and two. Number three, he formed and God breathed. We know that in Genesis 2, right? 2, 7, it says he was formed of the dust of the ground. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and again, spiritual and physical and man became a living soul. Book Education 20, page 20 says, this. now this is kind of a, a long paragraph in reading, but I, I think it deserves to be read. We'll get as far as we can within our time. But the reading is, Created to be, notice, in the image of God, 1 Corinthians 11, 7, you can read more about that. Adam and Eve had received, notice this, the endowments not unworthy of their high destiny, graceful and symmetrical in form, regular and beautiful in feature, their countenance glowing with the tint of health. Oh, I love that one, don't you? Mm -hmm. And the light of joy and hope. They bore an outward resemblance to the likeness of their maker. Nor was this likeness, likeness manifested in the physical nature only. Every faculty of mind, notice this, and soul reflected the Creator's glory. Oh, my, man, the way wow. it started out, that's the way it wants to end. Isn't that right? Notice, endowed with high mental and spiritual gifts, Adam and Eve, notice this, were made but little lower than what? Yeah. The angels, Hebrews 2, verse 7, that they might not only discern the wonders of the visible universe, but comprehend moral responsibilities and obligations. Sometime in this world we forget that we have responsibility to God. We have moral obligation to God and we need to be calling that back. When God simply said, you know, let us make man in our image. Mm -hmm. Can we possibly comprehend those words? I know I can't, 
but we're throwing it out to you today by the grace of God that we begin to say, God looked, God saw, God believed, and he said, here is man. I want him to be made in, my, in our image. Mm -hmm. Now, if we're made in God's image, by the grace of God, we need to keep that. Isn't that right? By the grace of God. Mm -hmm. And you know, God's thoughts toward us, they're always good. We'll mm -hmm. think about that a little bit more as we go. Our time is up right now. Yes. Amen. Thank you so much. What an incredible lesson. Appreciate all of that. I'm Jill Morricone, and I have Thursday's lesson, The Duty of Humanity. You know, when I think about Genesis, you all did such an incredible job setting the stage, who created, and how that creation took place, and the Sabbath as the capstone of creation, and man and woman being created. In the beginning, God, in contrast to atheism, created alone, in contrast to polytheism. He rules over creation in contrast to pantheism. Matter had a beginning as opposed to materialism. Mm. And the ultimate reality is God, not humanity. Mm -hmm. right. When we look at Thursday's lens, the duty of humanity. The lesson had three duties that were given to Adam and Eve in the beginning, in the garden. Mm -hmm. This is before sin entered the garden. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to give you four. And within those four, we're going to look at the duties, and each duty is connected with a gift that God gave to them. Within that, we have, Shelley, the ten takeaways. So let's mention the four duties, and then I'll go back and unpack them. Number one is care for the earth. Number two, keep his commandments. Number three, experience marital oneness. Number four, be fruitful. So let's look at those four duties. The first duty given to Adam and Eve is care for the earth. And with that duty came the gift. What was the gift? The gift of the earth, mm -hmm. the gift of the garden. We're in Genesis chapter two. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden. And what are those two verbs? To tend and keep it. That word tend in Hebrew literally means to work, mm. to serve. So takeaway number one, work is a divine gift. Mm -hmm. It's not a punishment. Mm -hmm. We often think work came as part of the curse after sin, as part of the mm. consequences of sin. And yes, there was a good deal of toil in, by the sweat of Adam's brow in the That's earth. Right. That is true. But work was given to tend the garden that was given before the entrance mm. of sin, mm. this duty of humanity. You see, it's not enough just to receive a gift. We need to work on it and make it fruitful. I think about Matthew 25, the parable of the talents. We're not called to bury that in the earth. Mm. We are called to develop, to cultivate, mm. to right. tend it, right. and it will develop. Takeaway number two, this develop what you have been given. Adam was given a garden to tend. Noah, he was given a boat to build mm -hmm. and his act would save the world. Joseph was given a household to manage and a prison to run and his faithfulness saved a nation and his family. Mm -hmm. Ruth was given some wheat to glean. Rahab was given two spies to save mm -hmm. and they saved her and her family from ruin. Mary was given a son to raise, and he saved the world. Mm. Jeremiah 29, I love this reference. In Jeremiah 29, he's talking, of course, to the children of Israel who were in bondage in Babylon. Mm. They had been taken as captive. In Jeremiah 29, 5, the counsel is given to them. Build houses, mm. dwell in them, mm -hmm. plant gardens, and eat their fruit to develop, even in the land of captivity, even where you don't want to be, mm -hmm. develop what you have been given. Yeah. That's right. Takeaway yeah. number three. Now, this is interesting. Yeah. We don't have a whole lot of time to develop this, but takeaway number three, work is actually connected with worship. The same word in Genesis 2.15, they were in the garden to tend and to keep. The same word for tend is the word used in Exodus 3, verse 12, when the children of Israel were going to go and worship mm. God on the mountain. It's the same word wow. as tend. It reminds me of Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. 
In Greek, it's your spiritual act of worship. Mm. That service, being connected with worship. Now let's look at the other verb. We had the verb tend. They were in the garden to tend, to work. But they were also to keep it. What does mm. keep mean? Shamar. It means to keep, to watch, to preserve. Mm. It showcases the responsibility to preserve what has been received. Takeaway number four, stewardship is biblical. We are called to keep, we are called to watch, yeah. we are called to preserve what we have been given. And what have we been given? Our health, our bodies, mm -hmm. our mind, our intellect, our morals and values, the Word of God. We are called to preserve how that is presented and handled. Mm -hmm. The earth and everything in it, other people that are entrusted to our care. Now let's go back to Genesis 1, verse 28. We're still talking about the first duty of humanity, which is care for the earth. Genesis 1, 28. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have, what's that word? Dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That word dominion means to take care of, to direct, to manage. This is stewardship again. Mm -hmm. Takeaway number five, stewardship is not exploitation. Christian stewardship acknowledges God as the owner of everything. Amen. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. Christian stewardship acknowledges God as the source of all power. Deuteronomy 8, God's the one who gives us power to acquire wealth. Mm. Daniel 2, God's the one who sets up kings and removes kings. Mm. Christian stewardship is actuated by service. Mm. Matthew 20, whoever desires to be great, let him or her be a servant. Mm. Christian stewardship is built on accountability. We see that in Matthew chapter 25. Mm -hmm. Let's go on to duty of humanity number two. Keep his commandments. And the gift connected with this duty is the gift of food. You may say, what in the world? <laughs> okay, so we're going to Genesis 1, 29. We see grace and obedience connected together in the Garden of Eden. Grace is the gift of food that God gave to his people. Genesis 1, 29. God said, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth. Every tree whose fruit yields seed to you, it shall be for food. Mm -hmm. Jump over to Genesis 2, 16. The Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. So what do we see here? Grace is freely bestowed. This is takeaway number six. Mm -hmm. They didn't earn the food. Mm -hmm. It was given. Wow. God gave them the food. We don't earn salvation. It is freely yeah. given. But yet that grace is connected with the duty, with obedience. Let's look at that. The next verse, Genesis 2, 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. From the day that you eat of it, you shall, what, Pastor Kenny? Surely die. Mm. The affirmative command of tending and keeping the garden is followed by the prohibitive command that they should not eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Takeaway number seven, restrictions are for our benefit. Did you hear that? Mm, yeah. Restrictions are for yes. our benefit. That's right. There is joy and peace in obedience. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 48, 18. Oh, that you had heeded my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river. Yes. There is peace in obedience. Now let's look at duty number three, experience marital oneness. Mm -hmm. We're in Genesis 2, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Eve's just been created here. And they shall become one flesh. This is not just talking about sexual unity, although it definitely encompasses that. This is physical unity. This is emotional unity. This is spiritual unity. Takeaway number eight, marital unity is a gift and a duty. Tend and keep your unity. Work to preserve and guard your unity. Keep your marital union. Forsake others. This is physical unity. Keep eyes only for your spouse. Emotional unity. Work through your issues. Forgive. Communicate with each other. Spiritual unity. Pray and study together. And the final duty is to be fruitful. And we know this. God said be fruitful and 
multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Yes. Take away number nine. Children are a gift and a blessing well, from the Lord. That's right. Take away number 10. The primary focus of that verse is children, yes. But I believe take away number 10, and we don't have time to get into it, but that we are called to be fruitful as in bearing fruit for the glory of yes, God. That's yes. right. Genesis chapter, uh, John chapter 15. We are called as Christians to pair fruit for His glory. Amen. So take away number 10. Christians are called to bear fruit. Amen. Amen. Wow. Jill, that yeah. was a beautiful right. lesson. Everybody's lesson was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Just have a few seconds left to give you each a closing thought. Creation was complete when God said it is finished. Genesis 2, 4. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord had made the earth and the heavens. When he said it's done, mm. it was over. Amen. And I talked about the Sabbath on Tuesday's mm -hmm. lesson. The Sabbath is meant to be a blessing for everyone, my friends. Isaiah 52 says, Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who lays hold on it, who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Yes, we should keep the Sabbath, but first we should also lead each other to the Lord of the Sabbath. So Jesus first and then the Sabbath. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. You know, God's thoughts toward us are still the same as from the very beginning of time. We read that in Jeremiah 29, 11. He says, I have thoughts of peace mm -hmm. and not of evil. That's right. Amen. In duty of humanity, we see that God gave to Adam and Eve in the very beginning duties, things that they could do mm -hmm. to work to preserve their unity and to tend the garden and keep it. Amen and amen. You know, I guess the point that I want to leave with each of you is to remember how condensed Genesis is. Mm -hmm. In the first 11 chapters, there's 2,000 years of the world's mm -hmm. history. Sometimes people say, oh, God doesn't get, lay out His commandments in Genesis. All you've got to mm -hmm. do is look at what goes on when he, we get into the patriarchal history yeah. and see mm -hmm. how Abraham had obedient faith and how God renewed the covenant with his son Isaac. Mm. So in, in Genesis, let me see, that's 26 and verse 5. Let me read that mm -hmm. to you. Genesis 26, verse 5. He's renewing the covenant with Isaac because Abraham obeyed my voice mm -hmm. and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. Mm -hmm. So don't think that Moses laid out all of the details. If you put 2000 years of history in 11 chapters, <laughs> that's pretty significant mm -hmm. distillation. We hope that you will join us next week for lesson number two, the fall. Until then, may God bless you richly. Amen. Putting God first can be difficult. What can we learn from Paul that will help us put God first in our lives today? Believing that he was putting God first, Paul persecuted the followers of Jesus. Though honest and sincere, he could not see how wrong he was. By the way, sincerity and honesty alone are not an assurance that we are true followers of Jesus. It was only when he fell to the ground and was blinded by the light of Jesus that he truly began to see. For Paul, putting God first then meant humbly questioning his beliefs and going back to scripture. 
After three years in Arabia, Paul returned with a renewed conviction that God had not given up on the world. Jesus was the Savior who wanted to reach every human being. Putting God first for Paul now meant to give himself first as an offering to God, traveling from city to city and village to village to tell others about Jesus. Nothing would stop him, not even those trying to kill him. One day, Paul and his friend Silas had their clothes ripped off in the middle of the city square. They were beaten and put in prison, with their feet clamped in the stocks. Still bleeding and bruised, Paul and Silas did the unthinkable. They worshiped Jesus. If you are at your lowest point right now, and everything seems to have gone wrong, there is no better time to worship than today. As Paul and Silas sang, God sent an earthquake. Assuming the prisoners had escaped, the officer in charge picked up a sword to kill himself. Paul and Silas remembered the beatings, torture, and humiliation that the officer had put them through. For Paul and Silas to have revenge, all they needed to do was wait for the officer's body to hit the ground. But in that split second, they decided to put God first, forgiving the officer and shouting for him to stop. That officer and his family met Jesus. By the end of that night, they were also worshiping the King of Kings. Powerful things can happen in the life of others when we decide to put God first. Paul and Silas put God first. Their example compels us to do the same. As we return our tithe and give our promise, we are challenged to put God first.
We serve a God who every now and again will test us. I don't know about you, but uh, I don't like tests. Um, for the super nerds in the audience, for those who, who, who are serious scholars, you, you may enjoy tests, but if I'm honest today, I, I, don't, I don't like tests. It's okay if I'm really studied up and I know what I'm getting ready to, uh, to, to cover in the exam, but I don't like tests. And maybe that's the reason why those of us who don't like tests, we struggle in our relationship with God because... If you serve this great God that we serve, he will test you. In fact, I, I believe I'm not the only person here who knows that if you walk with God long enough, he will put you through some tests. And, and tests are usually given in order to discover what you've learned over a course or a term of study. Tests are usually given after information has been provided to test whether you can retain and if you comprehend and understand what has been taught. God comes to Abraham, the Bible says, in verse 1 of Genesis 22, and says that God tests Abraham. And he tests him because God wanted to know if Abraham had learned what kind of God he was. God wanted to know if Abraham learned what it meant to trust in Jehovah. Because God tests us because he wants to know what we really think of him. The tests that God give us are not about our knowledge about him. It is our understanding of his character. And in order for God to understand where our faith is, he has to put us in tests. Now, it is interesting that God tests Abraham after he promotes him. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere, because God promotes him when he gives him the promised child Isaac, and now what God has promised has been manifested, and it is after he receives the reward. It is after he receives his promotion. It is after God moves him to the next level. Now, as he is beginning to walk in this fatherhood of many nations, that God comes around and gives him a test. Why would he test him after the promise? It seems to me the thing to do would be to test Abraham prior to giving him Isaac. Because usually a test, stay with me, precedes promotion. But in this case, God reverses the order. He promotes him to be the father of Isaac and then gives him a test. I ask you again, why would God give promotion to the one who may not fully be qualified? Well, that's just what grace does for us. We are not qualified to be called holy or righteous or the children of God or a royal priesthood, and yet we are promoted, yet we are called that which we are not yet. You ought to stop right here and thank God right now that he promotes the unworthy, that he gives life to those who have not earned it. If you had to qualify for the promise, if we had to qualify for the promise, watch this, there would be no church members. If we had to qualify for God's blessing, there would be no ministries. If we had to qualify for the blessing, there would be no conferences. There would be no preachers. There would be no church. But the church of the living God is a living testimony that God promotes us in spite of our faithfulness. God gives us gifts in spite of our shortcomings. He actually shows up to meetings when we don't invite him. Uh, Thanks be to God for giving us what we don't deserve. Somebody ought to say yes. 
You see, the test was not to determine his qualification for the promise, but to determine his loyalty. Watch this, because since God promised that Isaac would be the son, that he would, that God would bless Father uh, 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 Abraham uh, to be the father of many nations, God needed to test Abraham to see who Abraham loved the most, because this is the test. Some of us have fallen in love with what God has done, with what he's given us, with what he's blessed us with. We have fallen in love with it so much that the giver has to compete with his own gift. Ah, oh, stay with me. So God has to test us because the gifts and the blessings and the favor he shows are given to show how much he loves us, but the gift cannot compete with the giver. Isaac was not just a gift for Abraham and Sarah, but was also to be a gift to the world because he would be the progenitor of God's faithful people. What I'm trying to say is you are not blessed just for you to be blessed. You are blessed to be a blessing to the world. And for the believer, we've got to understand that your Isaac blessing does not belong to you. For the believer, your salary is not just to take care of your bills and your family and your expenses and to build your savings. No, for the believer, your salary is to be invested in the work of the kingdom of God. I don't hear anybody saying amen right there. Your influence is not just to be used to get people to, to be close to you or to close the business deal at work, but your influence is also supposed to be used to close the deal with your coworkers, to close a decision for Jesus Christ. Your personality is not just to be used to make people laugh or feel good, but you are supposed to use it to attack to, to attract people to the person and the character of Christ. Our problem is we think Isaac belongs to us. If that were some of us, and God tested us, asking us for Isaac, we would have said, no, God, you blessed us with this. But understand, anything you receive from God does not belong to you. It's on loan to you. And whenever God asks for it back, we cannot be stingy or hold on to it. Because if it had not been for God, you would not have that blessing in your life. So watch what happens. I'm going somewhere today. If you're still with me, shout yes. So Abraham is minding his own business. He is in a prayerful attitude. He is in a mode of listening. And, and God comes to him and says, Abraham. And Abraham says, here I am. Now, don't miss the power of this, because in the Hebrew, the English, the English does not capture the magnitude of this moment, because when he says, here I am, he is not saying, here I am geographically, here I am in space. He is literally saying in the Hebrew, I'm listening. I'm listening, watch this, with intent to do whatever you ask me to do. Now, now I, I want you to catch this because God speaks. Abraham says, here I am, which means I'm listening with intent to do whatever you ask me to do without knowing the details. This is the posture and mindset that God is trying to get his children to have. To, to say yes before we know the plan. To say yes before we understand the details. Abraham heard God speak. And if we're talking about prayer, because that's what we've been talking about all week, prayer is not just talking to God. Prayer is listening to God. And perhaps some of the problem we have is we spend more time in prayer telling him what we want. And not enough time listening to him so he can tell us what he wants. Oh, y'all going to make me work hard here today. Um, because the reality is, is that when God, when we are in prayer with God, it is a holy conversation where we ought to be doing more listening than we are talking. 
watch what Abraham does. Uh, watch what God does. He says, Abraham, he says, here I am with intention to do whatever you ask me to do. He says, I need you to sacrifice your son. Then he says, your only son, Isaac. Wait, wait, wait just a minute. If you've ever read the Bible, you understand that Isaac is not his only son. Why would God designate? Why would he specify and say, I need you to, to, to sacrifice your son? And just to make sure you're clear, Abraham, your only son, Isaac. Wait, wait just a minute, God. I, what about Ishmael? God makes a distinction here that is important for us to understand. God designates Isaac because he makes a distinction between the manufactured and the manifested. Hang with me. Hang with me. Because you see, Abraham and Sarah heard the promise of God. But they got so impatient because sometimes God doesn't work by your timetable. So they devised a plan to manufacture a blessing. Mm. To, to produce the promised. And Isaac uh, was taking too long to come. So they said, well, we'll take the handmaiden. Abraham, you go in unto her, sleep with her. And God says, that's a son, but that's not your only son. Because there's a difference between what you manufacture with your human strength and what I manifest with my divine power. Amen. Oh, I wish somebody hear me today. See, the manufactured is what you work out on your own. The manifested is when you wait on God to bring it to pass. The manufactured means if you put it together, it's your responsibility to keep it going. Okay, okay, you, you look at me like you don't feel me. Let, me. let me come a little bit closer. See, see, this is why as a pastor now, I am moving to away from premarital counseling to pre-engagement counseling. And let me tell you why. And that is because there are too many people who run to the office saying, Pastor, we're, we're in love. We've fallen in love. We've already set a date. Now we want you to get us ready for marriage. But oftentimes, people are manufacturing what God has not yet manifested. And, and, and maybe that's the reason why the divorce rate in the church is on par with folks in the world. With all this truth you got and all this doctrine you got, we're still divorcing at the same rate. Maybe it's because a lot of these marriages were manufactured. Maybe the reason we don't see a lot of power in our churches is because when nomination time comes around, we don't wait on God to show us who. We just throw willing bodies into positions that they're not really gifted or passionate about. And God knows. Can I preach it like I feel it? God knows that when it comes to some constituency meetings, it probably doesn't happen here, but in other places uh, where they manufacture votes and politic and move things around, you don't see power when there's manufacturing, but you do see power when there's manifestation. You just missed your shout. Let me help you. See, when you manufacture, that means you put it together. But when God manifests something, that means he creates it in eternity where he lives and in due time he brings it into time so that if God manifests it nobody can mess with it because what God makes he guarantees so he says give me your son your, your, your only son not the one you manufactured, the one I manifested. Not the one you produced, the one I promised. Your only son, Isaac. Then watch the next thing he says. He's being very specific with Abraham. He said, the one you love. Not the one you put up with, the one you love. D don't give me... Uh, the, the thing that you, you just could do without, 
give me what you can't do without. Mm. Holy Spirit's going to work in this place. Because watch what he says. God in a real sense says, give me back what I gave you. And what do you do today? I want you to help me with this as I wrestle with this myself. What do you do when God asks you to return your answered prayer? What do you do when God asks you to return what you waited on for him to give you? Because they waited. And God says, I want what you love because the truth is is that we struggle giving God back what he gave us God said don't give me what you produce give me what you what I promised it's another thing to give God back what he promised but only he can give it back watch the test comes when God says give me what you love because I need to know that you love me more than what I gave you. Because the truth be told, some of us are loving the things God gave us as much as the God who gave it. This is significant because God now is in competition for our affection. And he says, I need you to give me that which you love. Abraham hears this, and it is a strange request. Because God asked Abraham to sacrifice and give up his long-awaited promise. God requires Abraham to give up his God-given blessing. And when he hears this from God, please don't miss this, what God asked him was strange. Because he asked him to do what only heathens did. He hears the voice of God, but what he's asking doesn't sound like God. Because God asks him to do what only the pagans in that time did. Only pagans offered up their children for sacrifice. God is literally, oh, Holy Ghost, help me to get this. God is literally asking Abraham to act like a heathen. And somehow, despite the nature of the command, Abraham knew it was God speaking. Are you so in tune with God? We talking about looking up prayer. Are you so in tune with God that if he asked you to do something that was crazy, you would know it was his voice? If that were me, I would have thought, well, maybe I'm having some kind of homicidal ideation. Maybe I'm losing my mind. Maybe I ate something late last night and I'm having a bad dream. I, I, this doesn't make much sense because God doesn't speak like this. I remember when we were talking in one of my churches about doing a different kind of ministry to reach people we were not reaching. Some, uh, I said, well, we need to come up with this idea. And we had this, this new and innovative idea to reach people who were out in the streets and in the projects and in the ghettos and one of my elders raised his hand in the meeting and he said pastor God would never ask us to do something like that be careful be careful telling God what he'll never ask you to do because how many of you know our God cannot be controlled our God is not predictable our God is not conventional. He moves in different ways. And I want you to catch this. He asked Abraham to do what, what he would never think to do by himself. But because Abraham was so in sync with God, he knew that even though the instructions didn't sound like God, he knew God's voice. Uh, all right, let me, let, let me illustrate. Uh, so, so when my kids were little, when they would come to the door, when they would come, you know, in, my, in our bedroom, in our house, when our, our, our doors closed, the master bedroom where, where, we, where we stay, um, when the doors closed, that means you don't just walk in, you got to knock, right? You got to knock. So, so close the door, and I remember when they were little, 
Uh, see, when you live with someone long enough, you could tell just by their not who it is. <laughs> my, my, my daughter, when she was little, my, my daughter, she would, she would not very kind of gently and politely, you know, almost as if to say, you know, if you have some time, if, if you're available, um, if this is the opportune time, I'd, I'd like to speak with you, would you please open the door? Nice, gentle, polite lock, knock. My son, on the other hand, <laughs> did not have the polite knock. Uh, he, would, he would beat on the door. He would just beat and pound. He loves to make beats. After a while, if we didn't listen to the knock, he'd just start a rhythmic beat, you know, start making a trap beat. Y'all don't know what trap beats are. Put a trap beat on the door. He, 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 and I knew just by the way they knocked who it was. Know why? Because I lived with them long enough to know how they get our attention. Have you paid close attention to how God knocks on the heart of your on the door of your heart because if you pay attention those who live with God long enough know what he's saying so watch what happens he says I need you to go I need you to go to the land of Moriah and I and there's going to be a mountain I'll show you when you get there Abraham with tears in his eyes I can imagine and faith in his heart he packs what he needs for the sacrifice he packs the wood, the flint, the rope. He wakes his son and takes two servants with him so that they can begin the journey to the land of Moriah. He does not know the mountain yet, but God promised he would show him. Now please, when Abraham gets to the land of Moriah, he tells the servants, wait here. Abraham tells the two who have come with him, you guys wait here. Me and the boy are going up to the mountain. God has revealed to him mm, that this is the place, but before he goes to the place of elevation, he's got to leave the two people who helped him get to the foot of the mountain. Because when God gets ready to elevate you and take you to a new level of assignment and responsibility, not everyone who walked with you can go up with you. And some of you are crying over people who don't call you anymore. The people who unfriended you on Facebook. Don't cry and don't lose any sleep. It might be a sign that God is getting ready to elevate you. If he kept them in your life, they would talk you out of your miracle. If they, if they were still attached to you, they'd talk you out of your assignment. How many of you know some folks are good for the, uh, to get you to the foot of the mountain, but some folks can't climb the mountain with you? And that's why you ought to praise God not only for the doors he opens, but for the doors he closes. Praise God for the people he adds to your life and the people he uh, distracts and subtracts from your life. So watch what happens. He says, uh, you all stay here. Me, me and the boy, we will go up and we will worship. He tells them, you all stay here. And watch what he says, and me and the boy, we will go up, we will worship, and we will come back. Um...
sabulo bena tala na turaka ken marama dorbo ken go ne lewa ke kemuni ne suli suli ne kalo en da savi to raki tiku mai en na vida ne tuku tuku da sare da oti bi attitude na itomo sei vala vala ni mata ni tu ni kalo me bakan da sare da tiku mai en da bi tala no ta gati ko non re itomo o ira era naki naki karangan reba me re lewe ni mata ni tu ni kalo Sangai kini balam balam ni rapa kai topo taki eke sangai non remata ni tuni kalau be kalau mani sanga. Ena buku ni rai karisto era sa dinggoma era sa bagam bulai era sa non remata ni tuni kalau malangi yang go na kena itopo kena kena i bala bala ena bulat taki tau mandai buru buru go ni bera ni gai lako mai na itau kini mata ni tu na gai mai kau tiro na leo ni mata ni tu kina bonua kai sa bagam rau taki tumi nonra turanga ni mami kalau Pagarau beki mami dollar bono muni bosa, pagai ngam tak kiau ngam muni tamate ibal ibal dah mu betun beri kena kau bela taya day day, betun beri kena no muni bosa, muni rokobi kau pagar rokor rokor taki cisu ni mau bula. Mata ini wasi wasi ni songgo ni go, enda rongo dati kau mukina, sa kalungata, koira sa yalo malu, se drum drumu abu yalo, enda reza kina, na nonda pagar lalai kenda enda mata ni kalung. Non da vaga de taka, ni da tamata i vala vala da. Men da kasura, da sila, bibi voro, e na ruko di kau vala tai. Kene karua, e da sa reda, sa kalungata, ko ira sa dau tagi. Ni da sa vakilana non da lenga, vakilana non da nruka, vakilana vuno e da tukina, e da sa ngai kauti kendayani, me rao ni soli na vivo ka dengui, soli na kau kaua, soli na ngalala. Menda laku boli, ena boga tiangu kanda laku boli talanga ena ngalala. Ia, ena iwasi di songgo ni go, sa kalungata, ko ira sa yalo malua. Boleta ni da sa maru takana viva kalungata taki di kaluwe ke. Ena buru-buru go, enda sa narawa ni maru roya katau kena, endo na itobo zethere, itobo langi-langi, na itobo. Ni yalo malua. Kelapa kelamani. Na yalo malua. Na sanga ni darangai le tau kena. Yalo malangi ni saa lismo yo karisto. Sanga. Na yalo malua. Ke duna vonua e ngata. E talei. Ka vina kati me mbula teke kena. Na yalo malua. E na lomo sarangai ni nomo mata mbali. E na lomo ni nomo itoka toka. E na lomo ni nomo mata ngali. E na lomo ni nomo yavusa. E na lomo ni nomo koro. E na lomo ni nomo isongo songo lotu. Ni saa mbula taki ka vaka mata o taki o ya. Sana ya do me ito. Tobo ni mata ni tu na yalo malua. Ken vale vaka lamani. Enda saka ni redi tiku e ndone tuku tuku dha dha wale. Se ndone tuku tuku e adho wale tiku nga. Bona ndoka ni udhuta kena buru buru go. Enda redi tiku e ndona ka. E sulewo karisto. Ka vina kata mera vaka i tobo ki na uiru na lupena. Valeta. Ni sa i kwengo e na vaka burea na tiku velo mani. E na vaka burea na tiku sautu. E na vaka burea na mbula vi maliwa i totoka. Mbula vi maliwa i wusi vidake. E na vonu wa thamanga e na tukina. Ke na vi maliwa i voti ke irna i deni. Na yalo maluwa e ndona ka. E na vaka vuna na nonda vi maliwa i vinaka. Ke na mbula voti ke irna lotu wa karisto. E alo maluwa e ndona ka e na maro roya na viwe kani. E vaka lamani. Ngo na nungu i tobo. Kena nungu i tobo. Ena mata ni tu ni kalou. Ronga dana kaya kaya ni mula tamu. Madi wa se lima tiki na lima. Sa kalou ngata ko ira sa yalo malua. Nira na tau kena na bonua. Mwasa mba lagi. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit. Inherit the earth. Nata masarama dana yalo malua. Meekness. E rao ni da yalo malua. In da yalo ngangatiku. Na thapo na vii mbasa ini yalo malua. Ya ni wasi di songo niko. Ya vida naka. Enda na tomo le menda vanga nga, vanga ndikeva, oti. Enda kema i vanga ndilo ya ni. Enda vuku ni nomo mbula kena nomo mbula. Enda ngauna saranga ngo. Mikness enda vuru vuru makawa. Se enda vosu wabalangi makawa. Waya tutuba te ndona waini mate kaukawa. Waini mate kaukawa ngai kaumai. Me vaka yanga taka ndona tomo mate. Me mai ngunuwa, me vaka molu mutaka na nabi ni angona, me vaka molu mutaka na mosi, me vaka molu mutaka na rarawa, e tariko etiko. Se, vaka endona ose kila. Kime minu domo dosi, kime minu kila na ose. Kila. Kila sa ratu nga, seke ni vaka muli di rawa. E ni sa, e adho mai na ose kila ngoba na lingana endona ndau tereni teki wasi. 
endue kila na ka na kama bonosi kila na dawa na wase kilongo mai na kau kau ngurungura ni noni bolbala ena lutuso bu lutuso bu lutuso bu me adho masaranga ni le mano dina ngani tumwa na kau kau iya no na mano era ni lutu ki ko endo na ngani dolata tu na dolata dola lebu ndreke ndreke tavioka ndreke ndreke chaina ndreke ndreke mbuka ya reni lute ki kwanga endo na ngoni mwe na kuku ya etiku bua ya sarao ni ya lo malua sarao ni wa kuti ko epoka malua endua na ngoni lele ya no mono na rede na indini dhabu ni ko eda na tiko na horse power mwe ndu nga na indini lele ya tiko ba na kuku ni wose horse power e vi kalmani go na weakness go na yalo malua ko e vi na kati menda sarava kanda reida yani yalo malua ni ndua na tamata tambu saka yani sarao ni bogatara me sarenda me buta no 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 don don no ko don don me boga ga taki bua no na privilege ana vukun ra taleso ana vukun no na mbula talendua au na vi na kati mulika na no na ivola ba madala e ndua na ndau ni bola tambo o medio henry Toto kabiyo na na pamoja na lataka na mwasongo na meekness. Ronga the mwilika. The meek are those who quietly submit themselves to God. Quietly submit themselves to God. To his word and to his rod. Era sulira vaga wati wana kalou. Ena nona vosa kena nona veliutaki. Who follow his directions and comply with his designs and are gentle towards all men. And rara bu ni taito wa se tolu tiki neruo. Ronga da. Who can bear provocation without being inflamed by it? Are either silent or return a soft answer. That's what I'm talking about Kalmani. Meekness, sendu na yalo malua, ni gauna, esa ba katakata ria ni kina na yalo na mezunru kaloma katakata, iya, esenga vokandua ni yabalati, na nabe, ni no na yalo kaukawa, me kaukawa, seme katakata, seme dha, e molumu tu nga, e rao ni ngalu nga, se somu tu nga, e ne isau ni vosa vinaka. Ronga dhana kia ni kuri. One who can show their displeasure when there is occasion for it, without being transported into any indecencies who can be cool when others are hot e pata pata tu nga ni rasa kata kata na kena wo and in their patience keep possession of their own souls when they can scarcely keep possession of anything else oh sata toko ya e maroro na elona maroro na lomane be suka ti toka me ka ko ni tasere kapoka pe italia sato toko ya era di maro rena lona mai bona no maro rena ia u di burburongo boka da boi ko vio kalamani ta vi ko ngane go boka review tiko mai robo de tiko na vio libo libo ni kaka murake ongo saka li ni doni tobo binaka ni bate ni tu radio toro ya me no me de sigle be dai dai sana na uno robo de tiko kino ni tuku tuku ongo ya lo malua witness Eta do bo songo na yeu ni buru buru go me mai sina ino da tanga sina ino da vale sina ino da bage kake da ngame da sina ikina yen da dalata tiko na itobo binaka ni kalou ko e vina katana kalou me da bo songo na kando bo songo na me itobo ni no da bula rogoda they are the meek who are rarely and hardly provoked but quickly and easily pacified and who would rather forgive 20 injuries rather than revenge one having the rule of their own spirits oh sata toka e meni hallelujah turana kasa ko me dio henry mai na rusa ka bulu na ka da ya ka bua e sang ponta ni to rendo ni kala me so maleso en dua revenge one boleta ni ve suka toka na elona voka tule wa te ki koya maro ro koya clave ira na chiu na koko ni ken do ta ni ni baka sa me to ver ni la ko mo chisu Gai vaga mazala taka na mata ni tu ni kalo ene kene ndamo ndamo ko enda u rongo de tingo. Oh no no ko mata ni tu, eno na mata ni tu na ya lo malua. No ko mata ni tu, no na mata ni tu na ndau tangi. No ko mata ni tu, no na mata ni tu na ndamo ndamo bo ga ya lo. Era sena saranga ni dingo morao. Era no mero kango re da no luna. Bola to ya se ni tiki ni vaga na nanu. E se ni tiki ni bula ni tamato ya. Sama tau beira, na mata ni tu, na mata ni tu ngurungura, mata ni tu bagai walu, mata ni tu kau-kaua. 
Me lako mai. Na mwate ni tu kwa rawa raga tiko na mwate ni tu na mesaya. Me mwaka inga taka talanga na ibalu. Mwaka inga taka talanga na kanguru ngura kena kako ukuo. Me sere kira ka mwaka lala te kira. Mwate kena itiniara. Ne koe ya lako tiko mai. Na nondi vina kata me harmele veta. Kara mwaka dhere dhere ya. Santura kali elia. Ia. Ngai viso utaka mwaka ndua. E tavuki mwaka ndua na etobo ni nondo rai. Kena etobo ni nondo makasam. Ni hadho mochisu ngai dui dui mwaka ndua na kaya mwaka rota. E viso utaka mwaka ndua na ipala pala. Kena nondo mwaka la sarota melewe ra sengi ni dhingo mikoe. Sarota melewe ra sengi ni maro utaka soti. Na nono ni tuku tuku. Mulata, ni ochisu ya sengi ni langa mwaka 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 ndona tui nguru ngura, tui kukua. Ngai langa mwaka ochisu, mendona tui yalo malua. Tumwa na kukua kethe mwaka yalo malangi. Ia, e kauti kwe sombu, me yalo molu molumu, ka yalo malua. Chisu e nrambo takafina kasaranga, ni tuku tuku nga edhabu titiku. Tumbo ana kau kau tau tau kau melo malangi. Ia, e ana mata belewe ina i pailato, e me yalo malua bulikina. Ia o pailato vya kalamani, o koe lesi koe mai na empra mai roma, me beli utaki wole chutia. Tiku mwana kau kaua, mata takana tui, mai roma, ia, e sanga ni kalau koe, ni kai vesu woli, e ana nona ndoka ndoka, kai ana nona vya belewe. Sa ndoro ka wolo moya. O ni minakata mwa koti kenda, e ana i wolo na i sefu na ia. Kwa se tolu tiki na edhiwa. Sefu na ya, ero u mwola mwola nanga una pata ni Eisea. Nandro uboka sala te gira na Eisineli. Nira naka uboka mbo mbola. Rungwa dhana kaya kaya na kalu. Yana uboka sala ni Sefu na ya ibiri na tamata. Ni una buki dhana nandro mwosa na vima tangali me vosa sabu sabha. Mera masu kia dhana kina adha itchoba. Ka mera ngara vikuwe ena loma pata. Maina teka ndo ni bie uithi wai ni idhiwa pea. Uira ero mwosuiti yao. Erna kauto mena nungu ima nrali. Yeko kwa na ngwane eloa ni nungu matangali. Saba, kaya rao na kalou, ni oira nandui kai kai, erna ya adho mai, merna mai mwaka dhambu iso re Cherusalemi, erna mai lotu bwa na kalou ndo mbuli, rongo adho na kaya kaya kwe, yana tikine etini, ia ko ira na nungu matangali, sena nungu, mwene helewa, erna mwaka sebi, tikine etini kandua, yana singa kwa ya, kwa na sanga ni mandua, yana buku ni nungu ibala bala kitha nga, kwa tala indre indre kina vya u, ni una ngai kauti ira tani veiku, mai veiku na kaino, mwera alo ndo umara u, vanga vinga vya, ya kwa na sanga ni vya vya ilibutale, yana nungu ulu ni mwono tamu, saka iti kwa na kalou, yana ndona vya itala raki, yana ndona vya idhembu raki, yana dhaka mwai cheru selemi, dhamu tale sefu na ya, wadhi yana ngai vo, ni saya pavala na isele wau ni kalou, ni saya pavala na vya idhembu raki ni kalou, wadhi yana ngai vo, tikina itina karua, rongwa dhamu ulika. Au na vaka vodha nga veiko, endo na matangali yalo molu molumu, kanravu nravua, kara na vaka raravi, ena yadha ichoba. A kenra vo, remnant. Na lotu kenra vo, ena vo ma Israeli ngo. Se vosa taka. A kenra vo na Israeli, ena sanga ni dhakabu na ibala bala, sanga ni dundonu, se vosa taka na kalasu, ena sanga talanga ni kune, ena ngusuna na yami nda ubi baka isini, ni rana kana kakoto sombu, kana sanga ya nduwa mepoka rireira. Totoko ya na wakangu. Kasa kame ya wot safuna ya, ni na tala rakira lebu na Israeli na kalou, ena na vanga lala lebu, na tamata ndingi taki, na tamata lotu, ena vanga thambu isora na kena vanga lotu, na kena ndela ni ngauna. Ia kenerawa, ni yali meira na yalo mulmulumu, yalo malua, yalo samusama, saka na kalou. Erna talaraki, yana seka ni talaraki kene. Yana vwaka vwaka so. Yana vwaka vwaka nduwa na kena vwaka. Na revenant. Wadhiyo ya taltala. O ira, era yalo mulmulumu. Yana seka ni vwaka taka na kalasu. Yana vwaka 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 nduwa na kena vwaka vwaka. Yana wosivi, menta vwaka vwaka ikina vwaka totoro. Yalo malu wa vya kalamani, yalo samusaba, yalo mulumulumu. Yara vaka raravi ya na yadha ichoba ya na raramu ni kaya kaya sefu na ya. Kaya sefu na ya. Yara sanga ni vosa taka na kalasu. Sanga ni kune ngusunra na yami nda uvi vaka isini. Yara na koto sombu ka sanga ndua me vaka rireira. Kana tikina itina karua. Yara na vaka raravi ki na yadha ichoba. Me vaka na waini mate kau kaua. Vaka mulumulumu taka na mwosi kei na rarawa. O ira na yalo malua vya kalmani, tu vya ira na kaukaua. Ia, ena vuku i karisto, ena saa vaka mata utaka, mera kauti ira sombu, karama imbula vaka raravi, ena vaka mata utaka, mera mbiuta na nonra mbula, ena ngete ngete ni linga ni kalou, ngai laivo na kalou mekeveti ira ka kauti ira voliani. Yalo malua vya kalmani, yalo malua. Vaka endo na ose kila kaukaua, rani zidhi na imatau, zidhi na imawi, teke iliu, teke imuri. Ia, 
ena fuku i karisto sa vaka mata utaka menda sila elo molu molumu elo malua merani liu tegi ko e ndona ngone merani liu taki mai ve tsisu karisto e fe so wa se vat kine tolu singa vulkan dua na kenre rei rei na elo malua dua ka e fe so men biu ta ni keve be ki mundo na elo da e fe so ba tolu singa vulkan dua kena dunru dunru kena ndau nene kena bimba kena bosu boga da da kena ka da ke danga sa baka kina e ndau bi loma ne baka ki mundo ndau loma bi na ka ndau ka ku ni be dunru bi me baka sa se nga talanga ni dunru bi ke mundo tale ke mundo tale na kalo e na vuku i karisto na kalo mani o ira na yalo malua o ira ngo era malumu na non retobo mild and disposition Sanga ni ndo ya valati boga raw raw na elona sena lomana ena vika ya do boga boli boli tikoya sanga ni ya valati me zunru zunru me ya lo da boga totolo me ndo nene me ndo vimba se bosa boga da da sanga ni kene balamba lo ya ni na sanga ni temaki sanga ena ngau ne kata kata kina na vete maki kiwa me wanga na nono zunru ka wanga na nono da ye mbolata ni sa bangru rumi tu ene ruku ni bangru ruri tsu karisto ve kalmani ene senga vugonduni ya balati rawa ya lo malua kayo pola kala ve kalmani nono baka sama na ya lona na ya ngona sa bangru rumi tu ene kokou ne tsu karisto sa molumu kanda sila Gora bono e bina kata beta rao tsisu ene lo mo ne ka vi ndai ndai. Vina kata ko e me foka mo lo mo taka na kou kou ni alo. Foka mo lo mo taka na kou kou ni feeling, kou kou ni emotion ene ndo tubu mai. Bola tana yango gendo le zaka zaka taka na ka e vaka vuria na vaka sama. Ye ni sa foka mo lo mo lo mo taka na kou kou ni alo tambu. Foka mo lo mo lo mo taka na kou kou ni kalo. Ho ta vingu nga nengu ta mangu na tinangu a ubia ka e veiko. Nro sa bula vote ke karisto e uko e ndua. O sa foka foka rotiko. Sa pektiko mo lako vote ke ikoya. Kena mate ni tutu toka. Kena mate ni tuta alei. Sa foka rota gatu na kalo. O e rongo ame kalamani. E ra foka mbota ni kalo e foka tule wata gatu na toso. Kasa kini foka tule wata ki mebe ira. E no nei tabi na kalo me saumo na dha e foka e dhori. E ra vivo soti e na dha e dhaka be ira e na ndela ni loloma. Ia e ra loloma tu nga kata o mundu. Dina nga ni sa kamba dha kena iwalu. Ame kalamani. Tamata ya lo malu ena tuta ka tuna ndina. Kasenga nga ni na tanga ni mbutu mbutu. Me mbutu raki somu. Ya lo malu wa sini kene malibali ni osa ngongo. Ni osa mulu mulumu. Senga. Na ya lo me malu wa. Ia ya lo nganga ni kena tuta ki. Na kau kua kena ndina i karisto. Kolosa wa se tolu tiki na tini karua. Kau kolosa. Na ya lo vinaka. Kena ya lo boga turanga. Na ya lo malua. O kwa mdonga iboga isulu. Mepa kando sa anu na ndingi taki na kalau. O ike mdonga sa alo sabasaba. Kando lo mani. Ena ya lo ndaulo loma. Ena ya lo vinaka. Ena ya lo mulbolumu. Ena ya lo malua. Ena ndau vosota boga dende. Ya lo vinaka wya kalimani. Mbasi kamai. Ena ya lo malua. Ya lo vinaka. Ena senga ni dhata na wakana. Se dhata endua na tamata. Ena lo mana. Karaitha boga toto uwata na tamata kia venga. Vita alia. Kia vakaya. Voga rarao teki koya. Voga vunga. Buta koya di koya. Lasu teki koya. Kaseti koya. Voga vuria na kaadha. Me dha kama buwa. Voga lamani. Bola teni ya lo vinaka. Bola teni ya lo voga turanga. Bola tena ya lo malua. Ena vuku i karisto. Oh voga lamani. Zorvo ngone elewa, turankan maramongo, ena senga vokandua, ni yava latikoya, na environment, na situation, na kaya yadho, voka voli voli tikoya. Ndina nga, kepo kaya lawaki taiki, se voka dhadhani, se voka sangai. Ena yalo vinaka tunga, ena senga ni mundurawa, na nona yalo voka turanga. Na yalo vinaka vya kalamani, ona senga ni soma lesu na dhaya dhaka veiko, me voka, na kene ndo uvaka ya dhoro, uburubura. Uburubura, ndu indu ino, ona soma lesu na dhaya. Ia na tamate bulo vati kei karisto. Ia na namaki me lako yolo malangi. Ia na sangi ni saumu me bakao ya. Ia na ngalu voli. Ka laivo na kalau me ngai dhakawa na nadaka dhaka. Laivo na kalau me ngai saumu. Na vii kata udhoko. E vaka yadhori. Dua tala na vaka sama. Ia na ruku ni yalo malua. O ya. Na yalo malua e itobo ni yalo. Etitude. Yalo malua e ndona etitude. Ken matai. O koya. E attitude se itobo ni alo mulumulumu. Attitude of humility. 
Ma polo bir tomo e Filipai, wa se ruot kine tolu. Me ka koni vaka en dona ka ena vei leti sena vei ndo kondo kai wala nga. Mondo ya lo molu molu mu, kandu i vaka asama, ni sa uo sibidake wua kokoya kandua. O ma kalabani, alo ma alua ena kauti kenda sombu. En de sanga ni ndo kondo kai kenda. Ka vi na kata, na non ra vei voka vere vere ina taini me vaka vei kenda. Gona lenga lewe enda indai. Non da sa voka sanga ra. Na rongo na ve vere na ndokai. Ma i ve ira na kena vo. Hia, na helo malua kai tiko polo vero tome korni da senga. Oiko, kau tiko sombu. Leiva na kalou me ngai voka vere vere iko daki. Enda na kawa itaka. Non ra ngangandre sena non ra lenga na tamatatani. Weando na kaya senga ni mahta uvi kenda. Mula toho kenda. Na nave ni angonda. E kai ve iko. Mo ngara uni iko nga. Ka mo vakamo nga na kaya me mbole tiko. Ia ni sa zuro karisto ve kalmani. Na mbula va karisto sa na mbula ni mata ni tui ni kalou. O na ngwile dha viko. O na nanuma na nonra ka na tamata tani. Ia sa ando ni tomo dhedere. Sa ando ni tomo langi langi. Ngona munu ka kina viko ni tegu muni so ngonu go. Na yalo malua. E na bonga muri ana vi mwele wei. Sama sama vi mwele wei vinaka. E na bonu o dhamo nga. Kompo nga itiko tiko bulikina. E na e ka vio ngo. Senga ni kodho kodho. Membo leti yo nga. Senga ni kato dhoko nga en nongu. Na etitiud ni vei na nomi, etitiud ni vei raithi, etitiud ni vei singiti, e na kaa kithanga, e tu vei kenda. Kene katolo vei kalamani. Na yalo maluo, e ndo na etitiud se e itovo, o ya, o koe, e itovo ni talai rau rau. Etitiud of submission. Na yalo maluo. Rongo dana iperiru wa se tinika ruwa tikina e tinika diwa. Ye sa andau dhundru vei kenda na tamanda vaka yango. Ye enda andau ndoka. Ena sanga lini levu dha kisara na nonda talira orawa vii kwe na tamaniya londa kanda na mbula kina. Ka polo verutuma ipiriu na tamanda mwaka yango ni wangabuli dhikenda enda na kuita, enda na wostaki. Ya kakwe, ya mwaka ivei kei vina kata na kalome wangabuli dhiku. Kei vina kata na kalome wangabuli dhiku. Metumberi hiku. Ena vonuwa dhala meka kosa alako tiukina. Senga lini ona na mako ya ame kwe na kata ale ndo ndua. Ena rani hatho balatini vina kata na kalome. Vei tumberi, vei liutaki. Kila, ndo na katiko me mboleta na yalo maluo ya. Na nonda talera orawa vei ira era liutaki kenda. Nonda talera orawa vei ira era vaka tulewa hataki kenda. Menda ndoka karokova. Opia, ochisu ya kaya, opita ya kaya. He? Doka na tui, rara rara mwaka na kalou, kandoka na tui. Dhuru maikina, nonra, nonda ndoka ira na nonda vei liutaki. O kenda itiko elewe ra liutaki kenda, nonda italtala, nonda nga sinivuli, nonda iliuliu mbaka ni toka toka, iliuliu ni matangali, o ira, ira nga se vei kenda. E katiko ni tukutumbo, nonda ndoka ira, tala ira ora vira. Rongo di Paula, vero tomo i Roma. Roma tina katolo ndua. Mera tala ira ora vira na turanga levo kwa ira na tamata kia nga. Ni sa asenga na turanga sa tumbo ala me buwanga na kalou. O ira na sa turanga tu, sa lesi ira na kalou. Ya kwa kwa savorata na turanga, savorata na ilesi lesi ni kalou. Ya na dhunruvi kwa ira sa, kwa ira na savorata. Kwa ira na turanga na sa, siyaka ni vuni rena. Ve ira sa adhaka vinaka. Ve ira nga sa adhaka dha. O... O sanga ni remo limo, sanga ni remo kana turanga mo kita kana kai vinaka ena vi ndo kai ena nge ndo kai iku kina kokoya. Nisa nona itala ina kalou kokoya vi iku mo waka kina. Yeke mo kako sa dhaka dha mo rere nga nisa sanga ni taura wala nga na isele uwe kokoya. Nisa nona itala ina kalou medho nruvi koya sa dhaka dha. Ono rene kai vi utala tala. Ye mo kathapa, ke sona kai e kai vi yew na nungu vi liutaki. Sa vi dhonga dhonga bote ke ina kai kai ni voltambu. Asa aya dhoti mo yin papilodi. Satu dah ketua ni pukannya, otaniala, sakai mau saya rusin tui, saya ni takkan nak kena apa? Kau ni dua zuma dan dua kalau tadi zuma kita ngah bi saya rusin tui. Di mana ni saya bawa tu lewat na tui, yang na buku ni nona kalau kau otaniala, sakai otaniala, ya saya nak, ngau nunggu, awak sana bawa orang ke kena, wek kau na kalau ni nola malang, saya bi zonga zonga ruan, bawa tu lewat, ok anda, dah sana balik kena nona lewat na kalau. Ya wakal mani, na kanga uwe kati kungo, na ndondoka na vili utaki, rokova kanda vima ili uibata. Ndota la wakasa mwedhere, uwe vina kata mwawasea, uwea, na eti tiu ni nonda mbula vokara ravi. Yalo maalua. Nonda sulike nda vaka oti, menda vaka tautaka na nonda mbula vei karisto. Vaka tautaka nonda tuudake nonda dabe, nonda vila koyaki. Kayo aisea. 
Ni saka mo kango na turang ay siya tulos ng bulut ni kalimang ko chama ko ko na alas sa ni Israel ni dos sa alas sa ika tigo malua dona mga bulay kina ni dos sa mga tigo ka mga raranga dona kuko kina iya doa besenga ako ni dos sa alas sa ika alam malua dona pula mga tigo do mga raranga dona kuko wakina klaro ba kalma ni mo tinia no mo tuyo Jesus Kristo mo dona ay alam malua no mo pula no buru buru ko asa kini sa kabe dona kaya na bukunanga Vengo una, eh, vaca tara, me bula, vaca tara, vi tigo, vi tamana, sab mi tigo, vi tamana. Ona reza, ana tsoni, ona se limo, ti kine tolu, sanga bulka tolu. Kako, eo sini, zaka ven dona ka. Vaka iye unha, au salewa, me vaka na ka, ka usa rongada. Sando dono nungu lewa, ni usa sengene murena la mango, ala mo itamango nga, koko e sa tigo, me alama alangi. Jesu karisto ya, vaka lamani. E sab mi tigo, vi tamana. Don rono pasente kalou, don rono pasente tamata, iya. E senga bagando ni bagatara na nono itutu bakalau na kalawada na nono rovin dinin dinati kita mana kau kau itu wa iya saya lo malu ame telera orang wa bagar ravi kazuba ena bengau na ena bagutulewa esulewa itu mana tutak bagalaman en dinaki na na kaya kau cisu sakalau ngat kau irsa halo malu anir na tau kena na bunua bagatikla tina kan dua tina kalima engai kabi kenda engai soli na bagutulewa be cisu ni sa wati na nona mo yalo molo molo mo kayalo malo e buru buru ko o be suretiko tisu e suretiko mo yalo malo ni kwa da sila bimbi boro kavoro e na rugu na kovaltai nuku masu me akoya na nomu dingi dingi me daro mo e sirobata na rugu na kovaltai o no suretiko me dono dono masu mula tobe mo sula kiko turanga ne mami kalu o mo sula ki marida o mo sula ki cheke o mo sula ki salome e boro rongo tiko mai boti ki dinga e rongo dona biu libu libu ngo ni boka longa ta taka nona dingi dingi ni saya lo ma lu kan da sila be ke mu ni ne ngau nongo ci suni bombu amen amen